Alors, notre ordre du jour est un petit peu chargé. J'essaierai donc de rester euh, aussi bref que possible. Depuis le dernier forum méditerranéen à Dubrovnik, qui s'est tenu en octobre de l'année passée, nous avons été nombreux à nous rapprocher de nos partenaires euh, méditerranéens. Je pense que nous pouvons être satisfaits du travail accompli depuis le mois d'octobre. Tout particulièrement, je tiens à souligner le travail effectué par la mission d'observation électorale qui a observé les élections en Tunisie, les élections à l'Assemblée nationale constituante sous la direction du vice-président Ricardo Migliori. La coopération entre cette mission et les autorités tunisiennes marque une étape importante dans le développement des relations entre l'OSCE et ses partenaires méditerranéens. Je tiens également à souligner l'engagement des partenaires pour la coopération lors de notre session d'hiver à Vienne. En tant que monégasque, j'accorde une importance toute particulière à la dimension méditerranéenne de l'OSCE et au sujet qui est le nôtre aujourd'hui, le partenariat méditerranéen de l'OSCE dans une région en mutation, l'impact des élections depuis les événements de 2011. Je tiens à souhaiter la bienvenue aux participants en provenance des États partenaires de la Méditerranée et à qui je vais donner la parole dans un court moment, ainsi qu'aux personnalités qui nous font l'honneur d'être à nos côtés aujourd'hui sur le podium. Et ceci donc afin de faciliter l'interprétation pendant le forum. Si euh, certains d'entre vous ont des déclarations euh, écrites, merci d'en faire parvenir copie au secrétariat, ça facilitera le travail des interprètes. Donc avant de donner la parole à M. l'ambassadeur Ihor Prokoshpuk, Président du groupe de contact de l'OSCE avec les partenaires méditerranéens pour la coopération, c'est avec un immense plaisir que je donne la parole à Monsieur le Président Jean-Claude Mignon, président de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe. Monsieur le Président, vous avez la parole. Merci, euh, Monsieur le Président Jean-Charles Gardetto. Et si tu me permets, mon cher Jean-Charles, puisque dans le civil, nous avons l'habitude de nous tutoyer pour siéger sur les mêmes bancs au sein de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe. Et je ne vais certainement pas ici, à Monaco, perdre mes bonnes vieilles habitudes. Voilà, un égard à l'amitié qui nous rassemble, qui nous unit. Alors, je voudrais d'abord te dire et vous dire, mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues, à quel point je suis très heureux de pouvoir participer aujourd'hui à ce forum. Pourquoi Parce que, en fonction de ce que j'ai entendu hier dans cette même salle et de ce que vous avez entendu de ma bouche hier, force est de constater que tant votre Assemblée parlementaire que celle que je préside à Strasbourg, celle du Conseil de l'Europe, nous agissons sur un certain nombre de sujets qui nous sont communs et dans le même sens. Et tout ce que j'ai pu entendre hier ne fait que me conforter dans ce que je pensais avant de venir ici, nous avons véritablement tout intérêt à travailler ensemble, conjointement, côte à côte, pour faire avancer un certain nombre d'idées qui sont nôtres. Alors, je suis aussi très heureux de, de voir dans cette, dans cette salle, qui est très grande, un certain nombre de délégations, bien sûr, toutes les délégations, et, mais plus particulièrement aujourd'hui, celles qui concerne justement ce, ce sud de la Méditerranée, et qui siège aussi à Strasbourg, au sein de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe. Cette région de la Méditerranée du, du Sud est, est dans la tourmente. Je crois qu'il suffit de regarder les, les, les journaux télévisés, d'écouter les radios, de lire la presse, pour constater que c'est une région aujourd'hui et qui est en, en pleine tourmente, qui bouge beaucoup. Je me réjouis d'ailleurs aujourd'hui qu'à cette même heure, à Paris, se tienne une réunion qui rassemble ce que l'on appelle les amis de la Syrie. Depuis plus d'une année, le printemps arabe est à la une des, de l'actualité politique internationale. Beaucoup a déjà été dit sur le printemps arabe. Est-ce un printemps Est-ce est que ce printemps ne risque pas de se transformer en, en, en automne Et j'espère qu'il n'aura pas se transformé en hiver. Nous sommes bien sûr tous enthousiastes à l'idée de ce qui s'est passé dans ces pays, d'avoir assisté à ces, à ces révolutions, à ces événements qui émanent de, de groupes de jeunes, qui émanent de femmes aussi, très souvent de, de femmes. Et nous sommes bien sûr attentifs, car il ne faudrait pas que celles et ceux qui sont à l'origine de ces printemps arabes, aujourd'hui, soient privés de leur action et de ce qui a conduit à ces bouleversements. La transition démocratique semble être bien amorcée au Maroc et en Palestine. En Tunisie, après la révolution de Jasmin, qui s'est déroulée globalement de façon pacifique, 
Une assemblée nationale constituante a été élue et une nouvelle constitution est en préparation. Hier, je me suis étendu sur l'initiative de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe qui a, je pense, su intelligemment, et je salue l'action de mon prédécesseur, le turc Mevlut Çavuşoğlu, qui a su créer ce, ce statut nouveau de partenaire de la démocratie. Et Jean-Charles Gardetto a beaucoup travaillé aussi sur le contenu de, de, de ces statuts. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes très heureux, je le redis, et ils sont ici, dans cette salle, de constater que nos nouveaux partenaires pour la démocratie ont complètement, parfaitement compris le, le message et l'action qui doit être la leur au sein de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe. Je l'ai dit aussi hier, j'ai eu l'occasion de recevoir la semaine dernière, à l'occasion de la troisième partie de session ordinaire de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe, M. Mustapha Ben Jafar, qui est le président de l'Assemblée constituante de, de Tunisie, les échanges ont été particulièrement intéressants. Nous avons écouté avec attention son adresse à l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe. J'ai bon espoir que lorsque cette Assemblée constituante ne sera plus une Assemblée constituante, mais une Assemblée, et qu'ils nous rejoindront et qu'ils nous demanderont le statut, eux aussi, de partenaire pour la démocratie. J'ai eu aussi l'occasion hier de parler de l'Égypte. Je ne sais pas si la transition démocratique est, est compromise ou simplement aujourd'hui, elle aussi dans une zone de, de turbulence suite à la dissolution du Parlement et à l'octroi au Conseil supérieur des forces armées d'importants pouvoirs, notamment dans le domaine de la rédaction de la Constitution. Nous avons des doutes quant au rôle et au pouvoir réel du président nouvellement élu, mais je pense que nous commettrions une erreur de vouloir imposer nos propres standards d'une manière uniforme dans l'ensemble de ces pays. Je crois que nous avons vécu, il y a quelques années, j'en suis même convaincu, dans les années 90, des évolutions politiques importantes dans toute la région d'Europe de, centrale, d'Europe orientale, et avec le recul, force est de constater euh, qu'il a fallu aussi que nous nous adaptions les uns les autres donc, à ce qu'étaient euh, ces différents pays, à leurs spécificités, à leurs origines, à leur histoire. Et euh, en ce qui concerne donc, ces, ces, ces pays de la, la Méditerranée du Sud, je crois que nous ne devons pas tomber dans euh, ce travers, dans cette erreur qui consisterait à dire « voilà, ce qui est valable pour un pays doit l'être pour l'ensemble des autres pays ». Non, chaque pays a à son histoire, à chaque pays, à, à, à sa spécificité, et nous devons donc être très vigilants. La Libye, je ne peux pas ne pas en parler, reste un pays très divisé, et il est difficile de parler aujourd'hui de l'existence dans ce pays de conditions minimales pour amorcer un processus de transition démocratique. Nous devons les aider, nous devons réfléchir, nous devons prendre le temps de la réflexion pour savoir comment les aider, comment les épauler, comment leur permettre d'acquérir, d'obtenir aussi, d'arriver aussi à, à, cette, à ces standards démocratiques qui nous sont si chers et l'état de droit. La Syrie, je viens d'en parler très rapidement, c'est dramatique, c'est une véritable guerre civile qui a déjà fait des milliers de victimes. L'accord international sur l'instauration d'un gouvernement de transition soutenu le week-end dernier, notamment par tous les membres du Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies offre une véritable opportunité concrète pour mettre fin aux violences et avancer dans la mise en œuvre du plan en six points de Kofi Annan. Nous devons travailler pour assurer la mise en œuvre de cet accord. D'ailleurs que la Syrie, c'est d'autant plus dramatique qu'il y a de cela bien longtemps maintenant, c'est une époque que personnellement je n'ai pas connue, il s'est passé des choses absolument épouvantables et on peut peut-être pardonner à nos... nos nos parents, à nos grands-parents, et qui ne savaient pas réellement ce qui se passait. Mais en ce qui concerne la Syrie, on le voit en live régulièrement sur toutes les chaînes de télévision. Nous assistons en direct à des meurtres, nous assistons en direct à des drames par le travail qui est effectué sur place par les journalistes et aussi tout simplement par aujourd'hui ce moyen de communication extraordinaire et redoutable et qui est Internet. Et en l'occurrence, il n'est pas redoutable, il est, est efficace. Donc euh, oui, nous devons être particulièrement actifs pour euh, tenter d'imposer un certain nombre de solutions. Et je le dis ici, je n'ai pas la réputation d'avoir la langue de bois. Il y a un certain nombre de pays, notamment euh, qui siègent au sein du Conseil de l'Europe et qui, lorsqu'ils ont été admis à leur demande à intégrer le Conseil de l'Europe, qui se sont engagés à respecter les critères, les standards 
en matière de démocratie du Conseil de l'Europe et qui siège aujourd'hui au Conseil de sécurité des Nations unies, j'aimerais qu'il n'ait pas un double langage ou un langage différent en fonction de l'Assemblée dans laquelle il siège. Et je crois qu'il faut aussi le rappeler, car c'est tout à fait inadmissible, et je pèse mes mots lorsque je le dis, qu'aujourd'hui, les accords de Kofi Annan n'aient pas pu aboutir ou être mis en application sous prétexte que deux pays continuent à refuser de voter les résolutions qui sont présentées au Conseil de sécurité des Nations unies. Et lorsque j'ai été reçu il y a quelques mois maintenant par Ban Ki-moon, nous avons évoqué ce sujet ensemble et le secrétaire général des Nations Unies s'adressant à moi en tant que président de l'Assemblée parlementaire m'a aussi demandé à l'époque de faire en sorte que ces pays, ou du moins l'un de ces pays au Conseil de l'Europe n'oublie pas les engagements qu'il a contractés. Quel devrait être le rôle de nos organisations internationales face à ces défis et quelle pourrait être la contribution spécifique du Conseil de l'Europe et de son Assemblée parlementaire Tout d'abord, nous avons une immense expérience en matière d'accompagnement des transitions démocratiques. J'ai cité ce qui s'est passé depuis les années 1990. Aujourd'hui, nous mettons cette expérience à la disposition de nos collègues tunisiens, je l'ai dit, marocains et égyptiens. Notamment, la commission de Venise leur fournit déjà une expertise juridique de qualité dans la rédaction des constitutions et des lois, ainsi que dans la formation des élus et des cadres. J'insiste beaucoup sur notre commission de Venise, qui est vraiment un organe exceptionnel, composé d'experts que personne ne peut contester, et qui représente bien plus que les 47 États membres du Conseil de l'Europe. Et vraiment, la commission de Venise est un organe dont nous devrions nous servir encore davantage par ces temps troublés. Plus globalement, nous devons favoriser un dialogue avec notre voisinage afin de créer des conditions nécessaires pour le développement d'un véritable partenariat sur des sujets concrets qui nous concernent tous sur les deux rives de la Méditerranée. En 2009, l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, a créé le statut de partenaire démocratie qui permet au Parlement, qui partage nos valeurs et nos standards, de siéger au sein de notre Assemblée, avec pratiquement les mêmes droits que ceux qui sont membres à part entière. En contrepartie, il doit bien évidemment prendre une série d'engagements, notamment la tenue d'élections démocratiques, et avec vous, nous allons observer la tenue, le bon déroulement de ces élections dans les pays qui sont concernés. L'abolition de la peine de mort. L'abolition de la peine de mort, autant vous dire que nous sommes intransigeants à ce sujet. Intransigeants et que chaque pays membre de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe, membre du Conseil de l'Europe, et nous parlons d'une même voix avec Tobias Liagland, le secrétaire général, nous parlons d'une même voix avec l'ensemble des parlementaires, nous sommes intransigeants en ce qui concerne l'abolition de la peine de mort et bien évidemment aussi sur le respect de l'égalité des chances. En 2011, le Parlement du Maroc... Le Royaume de Maroc et le Conseil national palestinien sont devenus nos premiers partenaires pour la démocratie. Nous espérons, je l'ai dit, que d'autres parlements nous rejoindront bientôt. Et Monsieur le, le, le Président, pour conclure cette déjà un peu trop longue intervention, je voudrais vous dire encore une fois, je suis très sensible au fait que l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OSCE est jugée utile, opportun, d'inviter le Président de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe. Nous ne sommes pas concurrents. Nous nous complétons, nous devons travailler main dans la main, nous devons réfléchir, nous devons multiplier les rencontres. Je suis très heureux de saluer celui qui, je crois, dans quelques instants, deviendra le futur président de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OSCE. Je lui renouvelle ma proposition, à savoir de mener une démarche commune en Ukraine afin que nous puissions rencontrer, avant l'arrivée des missions d'observation, les dirigeants, afin de bien démontrer que le Conseil de l'Europe et l'OSCE, nous travaillons ensemble dans le même objectif. Et tous ces objectifs, je crois qu'aujourd'hui, ils honorent ceux qui les portent, à savoir la défense des droits de l'homme, les valeurs de démocratie, la défense de l'État de droit, et en ce qui vous concerne, bien évidemment, la sécurité et la coopération en Europe. Voilà, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous remercie d'avoir écouté mon intervention aussi studieusement. Merci beaucoup. Merci, cher Jean-Claude, cher Président. Merci beaucoup pour cette contribution. Je partage parfaitement ton point de vue sur 
la nécessaire coopération entre l'Assemblée du Conseil de l'Europe et l'Assemblée de l'OSCE, euh, dans lesquelles je siège, dans toutes les deux, et euh, dont les objectifs se rejoignent. Donc euh, c'est tout à fait la, la démarche qui, qui s'impose à mon sens également. Sachez, chers collègues, que l'Assemblée parlementaire OSCE, euh, tout autant d'ailleurs que l'Assemblée du Conseil de l'Europe, accorde une grande importance à ces relations avec euh, euh, donc euh, l'une avec l'autre, et que la présence avec nous de, du président Mignon dans ce forum est un signe de notre bonne coopération et d'une bonne d'une bonne entente. Je voudrais à présent poursuivre avec l'ordre du jour et donner immédiatement la parole à Monsieur l'ambassadeur Ior Prokosh Pouk, euh, président du groupe de contact de l'OSCE avec les partenaires méditerranéens pour la coopération. Euh, l'ambassadeur Prokopchuk est représentant permanent de l'Ukraine auprès des organisations internationales à Vienne. Il a précédemment occupé le poste d'ambassadeur en Lituanie. Et en 2013, il présidera le Conseil permanent de l'OSCE dans le cadre de la présidence ukrainienne de l'OSCE. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, vous avez la parole. Dear Vice, Vice President Jean-Charles Gardetto, distinguished members of the Parliamentary Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my privilege to address the Parliamentary Assembly Mediterranean Forum in my capacity as chairperson of the contact group with the Mediterranean partners and uh, briefly outlined the work that we do in Vienna. I wish to sincerely thank the host for the kind invitation and warm hospitality extended to all of us in this beautiful country. At the outset, I would also like to note with high appreciation the OEC Parliamentary Assembly's valuable contribution towards raising awareness of the OEC's Mediterranean dimension within the organization itself, and also through outreach activities and active engagement with parliamentarians from Mediterranean Partners for Cooperation. Members of the Parliamentary Assembly continue to play a substantial role both in fostering public support for the Mediterranean dimension and acting as a bridge between the organization and national parliaments and governments. The current forum will undoubtedly serve a meaningful and important goal of exchanging views on the impact of momentous transformations that had swept the South Mediterranean, and significantly of generating ideas on how to best use available OEC toolbox to support aspirations of the peoples and countries of the region for dignity, prosperity, and democratic change. It is obvious that recent developments in the South Mediterranean have once again testified to the ongoing high relevance of the OEC concept of comprehensive and indivisible security, which addresses in entirety all three dimensions, political military, economic and environmental, and human. It is this concept that underpinned the OEC dialogue and activities over the last nearly four decades that allowed to preserve and strengthen peace and security in Euro-Atlantic space, enhance military transparency and predictability, effectively support transition processes based on OEC principles and commitments, advance human rights and freedoms, which remain at the heart of the OEC security concept. As the OEC contemplates the avenues for realizing the vision of a security community at its space, it is worth recalling again that at the OEC Astana Summit of 2010 the participating states recognized that the security of the OEC area is inextricably linked to that of its neighboring regions. Developments in the South Mediterranean in 2011 have amplified the relevance of this connection. Thus, in December last year in Vilnius, the OEC Ministerial Council adopt adopted a specific decision on partners for cooperation, aiming to enhance further the partnership for cooperation in the three OEC dimensions according to the needs and priorities identified by the partners. The ministerial decision clearly prescribes two principal tracks of interaction. First, enhancing political dialogue and sharing good practices, and second, practical and action-oriented cooperation. This guidance informs the activities of the Ukrainian chair of the contact group of 2012 at implementation of the, ministerial, uh, of the Vilnius ministerial decision 
and responding to opportunities and challenges we face. From this perspective, cooperation with the partners was also addressed at the recent OCE Annual Security Review Conference held in Vienna just over a week ago. In terms of dialogue, the Mediterranean contact group in the OSCE remains the key format with full, full participation of the partners and the participating states. It serves as a platform for sharing experience and good practices of the OSCE, particularly in the areas of preventing and settling conflicts, promoting cooperative approaches to security and fostering cooperation, developing confidence and security building measures, and joining efforts in fighting transnational threats, promoting consolidation of democratic institutions, protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So far, the meetings of the contact group this year reflected upon issues of civil control over armed forces with focus on the OEC code of conduct on political military aspects of security, areas of energy sustainability and water management, all subjects of interest to our partner states. The added value of every such meeting is that they address not only the methodological approaches based on OEC commitments and experience, but also practical applicability aspects demonstrated on specific country cases. The next meeting of the group in July will be dedicated to the OEC's third dimension, encompassing human rights and fundamental freedoms, with particular fo focus on uh, election legislation and election observation. The audit director, uh, Mr. Lenarczyk, will be participating in that meeting, along with a number of other distinguished speakers. The regular dialogue in Vienna at the ambassadorial level is significantly strengthened by exchange of high-level visits. And in this respect, I would want to recall and note the address to the OC Permanent Council by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Jordan in March this year, and visits by the OC Secretary General and Director of ODIR recently made to the region. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in seeking to promote the second principal track of interaction, action-oriented cooperation, which would allow to effectively reinforce political dialogue, a list of potential projects and topics of potential cooperation was developed and circulated to the OEC Mediterranean partners in March this year. The list reflects the OEC areas of expertise and interests initially expressed by partner states. It serves as a working tool and is intended for helping Mediterranean partners and participating states to identify concrete activities and prioritize their implementation. The listed project ideas can be further refined and tailored in accordance with the indications of Mediterranean partners and potential donors. The projects can be undertaken by individual partner states based on their needs and priorities, but also entail involvement of a number of interested states, thus promoting regional cooperation. Let me use this opportunity to note the positive response of the government of Tunisia to cooperation with the ODIR, particularly in the areas of election legislation and observation. May I use this platform to encourage representatives of the Mediterranean partner states to give most careful consideration to the proposals of assistance from the OCE, assistance that would not boast extensive financial resources, but offer OCE's comparative advantages and decades-long experience and expertise in tackling common challenges in all three OCE dimensions, as well as supporting transition processes in a focused and tailored manner. Mr. Chairman, in Vilnius, the OEC participating states agreed that the OEC's experience in different areas can be of interest and potential benefit for the partners while taking into full account their prime responsibility for making national political choices, as well as their specific political, cultural, and religious heritage, and in accordance with their needs, goals, and national priorities. This statement vocally reconfirms that the OEC's relationship with the Partners for Cooperation is firmly rooted in partnership and rests on the principle of mutual respect and trust. I would respectfully, respectfully submit that such approach should continue to guide us in further exploring areas of enhanced interaction with the partners and possible assistance from the OSCE to make our efforts 
successful and mutually beneficial. Before concluding, let me also inform this distinguished audience that as Ukraine is preparing for assuming the chairmanship of the OC in 2013, two weeks ago the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine presented to the OC Permanent Council in Vienna an outline of Ukraine's priorities for the next year, highlighting in particular the interest to promote dialogue and cooperation with the partners. I trust that today's discussion will become another meaningful contribution in strengthening the OEC engagement with its Mediterranean partners and charting the way forward. Thus, I look forward to and wish all of us an interesting and fruitful discussion at this forum. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Je souhaite à présent donner la parole à nos autres invités. Si vous avez des questions ou des commentaires, je vous invite à le faire dans le cadre du débat qui va suivre leurs interventions et les remarques des partenaires pour la coopération tout à l'heure. Euh, vous savez que nous tenons une liste euh, des euh, demandes de parole et je vous invite donc à, à vous faire noter sur, votre liste, sur cette liste si vous souhaitez intervenir. Sans plus attendre, je donne immédiatement la parole à M. Mohamed Abdulaziz, vice-ministre des Affaires étrangères et de la coopération internationale de la Libye. Je serais tenté de dire de la nouvelle Libye. Monsieur le ministre, vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Uh, with your permission, I would like to start by extending our deepest gratitude to the OACE for uh, giving, giving us the chance to uh, participate in this major assembly. Indeed, uh, we've been following up the work of the OACE with a great admiration, and we are very much looking forward to have this opportunity to participate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving us this opportunity. I also wish to take this opportunity to express our deepest gratitude to the authorities of Monaco for the warm reception and generosity. I think this is something that is indicative of the fact that Monaco is, has a big heart to receive those from north or south, east and west, with all openness. And in fact, yesterday when we had the reception, we have heard that Monaco is receiving about 120 nationalities <coughs> coexistence together. I hope that uh, we in our countries also will be able to have our people coexist with each other for the sake of building democracy and the rule of law. Uh, moving uh, in Libya from the state of the revolution to building the state of democracy and the rule of law is extremely a challenging task. And if I may make a general comment that some people think that the revolutions in North Africa are similar to each other. Perhaps they are similar in terms of objectives, but the difference between the revolution in Libya and that in Indonesia and in Egypt is that we are really starting almost from a scratch because we are rebuilding everything from a scratch. While the other structures in Egypt and in Tunisia, they, have, they are in place, and therefore the challenges for us is triple, not only double. The question that imposes itself is what kind of challenges that Libya has at this particular stage. There are a number of challenges. I would like to summarize them very quickly. This is in the, con in the context of the overview that I would like to provide to you to have a good picture on what's going on in that part of the world. The first challenge is maintaining internal security and peace. We cannot really move forward with building a state of, of, of democracy and the rule of law if security and internal peace are not prevailing. The second challenge is the border control and border security. Indeed, as you know, Libya has about 1,900 kilometers of sea coast, and we have about 4,000 kilometers of border land borders. For us, it's extremely challenging to secure our borders in order to avoid the type of smuggling that we are experiencing at the moment in terms of weapons, illegal migration, uh, drug trafficking, uh, religiously extremist elements that are moving across the borders. For us to maintain this type of uh, border control, we need this type of assistance and cooperation, not only with our neighboring countries, but also with the countries in the north or the, or the Mediterranean. The fourth a challenge is the collection of weapons. You mean disarming the freedom fighters. 
we are really still struggling with that issue. And the traditional government has did its best, but we do expect that this process will be completed once the Ministry of the Interior is put in place, so as the Ministry of Defense. The absorption of the freedom fighters is, is extremely challenging for one particular reason, that generally uh, to absorb them, it is very costly. And we are now preparing a plan to translate the basic needs of the freedom fighters into figures and to see how we can move forward. Some people feel that the presence of weapons in Libya is a threat to security indeed, thanks to the presence of weapons of the freedom fighters that continue to maintain the security in the country, otherwise it would have been really a chaotic. At the same time, we do recognize there are some isolated incidents that we are dealing with. The fifth challenge is the rebuilding the military, the police, and the judiciary. Indeed, it is extremely challenging at times when we are really embarking on the implementation of the transitional justice program that should be comprehensive, together with embarking on the national reconciliation program. Without having a proper judiciary in place, without having a proper police in place, without having proper military in place, it will be difficult for us really to ensure that these enabling factors toward the democracy are in place. Otherwise, it would be very difficult for us really to move forward. The other challenge that we have at the moment is to what extent we can also um, somehow contain the type of internal intentions inside Libya. As you know, there are some uh, of the military, uh, I would say, uprisings in a very isolated manner, either the south of Libya and particularly the south of Libya, because if there is a problem that could threaten the security of Libya in the future is really the situation in the south. And the last challenge uh, that we have at the moment is how to advance judicial cooperation in criminal matters. We have already started cooperating very closely with our neighboring countries as far as judicial cooperation in criminal matters when it comes to extra extradition of the followers of Gaddafi, those I call them the fugitive of justice. And we're hoping that some countries would follow the example of Tunisia by surrendering uh, the former prime minister. We are hoping that other countries in the region would also follow that to help us extradite those who are called you know, for justice to have a fair trial back in Libya. And the last point in relation to the challenges is how to conduct free and fair elections. In addressing these challenges, indeed, we relied first our, on our national capacities and means, which continue to be limited, I must confess. And the second is the support of the international community, either at the bilateral level, at the regional level, or at the multilateral level. At the bilateral level, I would like to take this opportunity to express our deep gratitude to the countries who stood with us at so the most difficult times, in fact, during the revolution and after the revolution. And I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to those countries who did help us bilaterally to sustain that support, because without sustaining the support, there will be a gap in, in marching towards the building of the democracy and the rule of law. At the regional level, we are very grateful to the European Commission, because from the beginning, the European Commission voiced its concern and in the context of the operation that have taken place during the revolution, the European Commission came forward with a specific suggestions in relation to how helping us with the control of borders and also a relation to the capacity building that is extremely important for us in, the, in various fields. And at, at this stage, I would like to welcome the comments made by His Excellency Jean-Claude Mignon, the President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, because this is extremely important. Unless the support is sustained, it will be difficult for us to move forward with the full-fledged, without the full-fledged support of our friends. At the same time, I would like also to welcome the comments made by His Excellency Ambassador Prokopos, the Chairman of the OSCE Contact Group, also for the comments that he made in relation to supporting Libya as far as the process of democracy is concerned. I would like also to add to those who have helped us, the League of Arab States, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the African Union, though it is limited, but we continue to rely on the political support 
of the regional organization as well as the material support that can, they can provide to us. Now, the question which imposes itself at the moment, what is the immediate priority for us? The immediate priority, as you know, is the preparation for free and fair elections. And for your information, uh, the elections will start tomorrow. It is expected uh, to start at 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evening, hoping probably it may be extended at 10 o'clock in the evening, hoping also that there won't be any incidents which may disturb the, the process of the elections. We are pleased also to see that international and regional observers are also put in place. And we are very grateful for those who took the initiative, either bilaterally or multilaterally or regionally, to come forward and would like to see and observe how the conduct of the elections are taking place in Libya. Uh, basic facts, uh, we have about 142 political parties which have been established. To our surprise, uh, Libya has not experienced political parties in the past. Culture didn't exist for more than 42 years. But in that short period, to have 142 political parties established, I think we see it as a step forward in the right direction. Uh, there are 83% of eligible voters that have registered, representing about 2.7 million population. 80 members of the 200 of the National Congress seats will be chosen from a party lists, and 120 will be elected as individuals. Regional international observers, as I mentioned, secured. Uh, it is also important to note that OECE and other regional organizations are really advancing the contribution and participation of non-government organizations and uh, uh, professional associations. In Libya, to my surprise, in just a short period of time, there was more than 4,000 NGOs and associations that have been established. Some of them are directly involved in the monitoring of the elections as well as raising the public awareness campaigns to help the public people to understand how the process is. Uh, I would also would like to note that uh, 40 registration and election centers have been also established. We have some problems in relation to the distribution of seats. As you know, the East has already uh, protested the eastern part of Libya because they felt that uh, the number of seats are not adequate to the extent that we have two main cities, Zawiya and Gharian, uh, yesterday had taken the initiative and went to the East uh, proposing that they are prepared to surrender uh, their seats for the sake of strengthening the position of the East which was taken as a demonstration of solidarity instead of having this type of friction between the East and the West of Libya. The problems encountered at the moment, as far as the elections are concerned, with all transparency, some of them are related to the type of sense of insecurity that uh, some people feel inside Libya, either the, uh, the East uh, or in the South. We have also a problem of inadequate public awareness campaigns. We should recognize that we have not really done our best as far as public awareness campaigns. But the, there was really a plan that was implemented, but we still feel the public awareness campaign was inadequate. But still, the process, I think, is going on. The third, uh, the third problem that we have at the moment is to what extent that the security plan that was put in place will be sufficient enough to prevent any occurrence of disturbing elements as far as the process and the conduct of the election is concerned. But despite the uncertainties and occasional violence that may be expected, hopefully the elections will be held in time and hopefully that we reach our goal of electing the 200 members of the General National Congress. Now, the question which imposes itself is, what is the impact of the elections? Uh, and this is a question that is of relevance to this uh, uh, discussion that we have at this particular stage. From our point of view, there are two aspects. We have the structural aspects of the impact of the elections. I wish to refer particularly to the need to organize the first meeting of the National General Congress. It has to be done fast. And the second is the uh, National Transitional Council at the moment should establish the regulations under which the Congress should be, should be held. And the third point is the Congress should start prioritizing its work, including the establishment of transitional government. I must also uh, uh, mention to you that uh, judging from the public opinion at this particular moment in Libya, they felt that the traditional government at the moment has not performed this task the way it should be. In fact, it is a technical government, but it was not a crisis government per se. And therefore, the public opinion at the moment is very much oriented 
in the direction of ensuring that the forthcoming transitional government should be a crisis management government and able to take fast decisions. Uh, the, the, the third point is how to ensure a smooth transition. I think the smooth transition, it means that it, we have to have a plan for the transition from the existing transitional government to the new uh, transitional government that is going to be elect, uh, prepared or established just uh, four weeks after the first meeting of the National Congress. What is really important at this stage is how to take advantage of the experiences of other countries that have taken, uh, that have gone through the same experience that Libya now in relation to the transition from a government to the other. And here we are also relying on the friends that they do have the expertise, they can share with us the lessons learned as far as the transition period is concerned. Now, this is in relation to the structural impact of the elections. In relation to the political impact of the election, I would like to say that the, at the people's level, the elections mark truly really the expression of the democratic right of the people to enjoy their rights. You know, for 42 years, I would say even 52 years, because I do recall that the last elections of the Libyan parliament was back in 64 during the kingdom time. Imagine for 50 years that the Libyans have been deprived of expressing their rights as far as the elections are concerned. The second point in relation to political impact is how to move from indignation and equality to inclusion and integrity. And I do recall that whenever I talk to some of the colleagues from other countries who have gone through this, they always advise us that to move in that direction without clear national reconciliation program is not going to be easy for Libya to embark on the establishing the state of democracy and the rule of law. And therefore, we also look forward to the experience of other countries as far as the national reconciliation programs are concerned. I would also say that the completion of the elections marked an essential step toward the drafting of the constitution because really we have to rush to uh, establish the committee responsible for the constitution. And that process, which is so-called the 60 members uh, committee that will, that will draft the constitution, we are hoping that, that the constitution will be drafted in a way that does respond to the specificity of the Libyan society, but at the same time to, be, to have full commitment of our obligations vis-a-vis -vis international uh, treaties, uh, human rights standards and norms, and this is something that's extremely important because without having this reflection of our commitments regionally and internationally, the Constitution will not be in, in, in a position that it does reflect our commitments nationally and internationally. Now, the main question is, who is going to win the elections? This is, some of the colleagues have approached me many times, also the press, they were saying, but in your view, who is going to win? I think based on, on, the, on the study of the political panorama in Libya at the moment, given the fact that we have this number of, uh, of political parties and other, uh, other actors, there are in fact three main uh, ten uh, uh, tendencies. There is the group where they call them the secular-minded modernists. Indeed, I would, suggest, I would say that my conclusion, they do represent about 45%. They do have the vision and they, they are really modernists and they would like to advance uh, this uh, perception as far as you know, the impact of the, of the elections uh, is concerned. And the second group, well, they call them the Islamists, who cover a wider spectrum. Uh, for your information, Libya has not experienced, for example, the brotherhood, the Islamic brotherhood uh, culture. I think the Islamic brotherhood culture came uh, from Egypt if I recall, through after independence, when some of the teachers and some of the employees who came from Egypt, they did have the ideology of Islamic Brotherhood and they started spreading you know, this ideology in Libya in a very limited way. But either during the kingdom time or during the, the Gaddafi's time, the Islamic Brotherhood was not really active to the extent they are completely prevented from the political scene. But now it's being revived at the moment and there is quite, um, I would say an acceptance by the majority of people because they raise the flag of solidarity and social justice. And we don't know yet whether there will be the overwhelming, uh, um, I would say, majority that would uh, gain more seats or not. It remains to be seen. And the third, uh, I would say, tendency in Libya, which there are only few political parties that wish to return to the constitutional monarchy. 
uh, as you know, uh, when we got our independence in 1951, in fact, uh, the, I would say that the, the kingdom was kidnapped for 42 years. Some of the political parties believe that the solution for Libya, given its dimension of tribalism, and given the fact that the Libyan society has not experienced the culture of the political parties, they thought that by advancing the idea of return to the constitution monarchy could be a solution. But unfortunately, this is not going to fly that much because most of the young people who are ranging from 18 to 50 years old, they are during the last 42 years, they have not heard about the constitution monarchy. And it would be a pity if this particular vision, politically speaking, is not taken into consideration because if there is a stable you know, situation that gives some kind of opportunity is to return to the constitution monarchy. But I do not think that this would really fly. Um, as I mentioned to you in conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that it would be difficult at this stage to predict the ideological uh, and religious flavor of the, uh, of the legislative body in the future, but hopefully within the next uh, few days after the completion of the election, the picture will be probably clearer. Finally, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I have gone through the various draft resolutions that were submitted to the OAC forum, and I would very much uh, underline the fact that uh, we are extremely happy and uh, feel proud that we are associating ourselves with an organization that is uh, pushing forward with courage and conviction the type of partnership between North of the Mediterranean countries and South of the Mediterranean countries. I think those draft resolutions that are being now discussed either in the field of in, in, uh, pushing and towards the democracy, uh, issues of human rights, uh, combating terrorism, uh, gender equality, uh, women empowerment. These are uh, themes that became of particular importance to the new Libya at the moment, and I would like also to boost the agenda forward. Of particular importance, Mr. Chairman, and with the permission, I would also refer to the draft resolution that is submitted uh, uh, from the uh, Palestinian National Authority requesting that this should be treated as a partner uh, within the organization. I think this is a step in the right direction. I'm hoping that this request would be accepted because the policy of OICE is for, for inclusion. I think by including all the actors in the Mediterranean will be extremely important without any prejudice to anyone, but to give the chance, politically speaking, to those who would like to be partnering with you, also to, in, 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 to, to, to raise the flag of tolerance, to ensure that the dialogue is very open, and also to somehow to decrease the type of tensions that we have in order to be able uh, to move forward with having the Mediterranean as a secure area. I would like also to, to underline the fact that the security in the North Mediterranean is indivisible as far as the security of North Africa is Mediterranean. I see it as a duty of the countries of the North you know, to help the countries of the South because the security is available. It is really a duty. And without the security, cultural cooperation, tourism, economic cooperation, investment is not going to move forward. So the security in North Africa is a prerequisite, you know, for the security of North Mediterranean and also for a future cooperation. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman, and forgive me for taking too much time, but it is an opportunity, you know, to brief you and have an overview on what we want in Libya, and I will be more than happy to listen to any questions and to entertain any comments. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre, pour votre intéressante contribution. Je donne maintenant la parole au Sénateur Francesco Amoruso. Le Sénateur Amoruso est le vice-président de l'Assemblée parlementaire pour la Méditerranée. Monsieur le Sénateur, vous avez la parole. Merci, Signor Presidente. Consentitemi innanzitutto di ringraziare i nostri ospiti per la calorosa accoglienza riservataci quest'oggi nello splendido e dinamico Principato di Monaco. Sono veramente grato a Sua Eccellenza l'Onorevole Eftimiu, Presidente dell'Assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE, e a lei, Onorevole eh, Gardetto, Vicepresidente dell'Assemblea dell parlamentare dell'OSCE, per il gentile invito rivolto all'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo a partecipare a questa riunione e rafforzare la nostra cooperazione sulla base di quei valori di democrazia condivisi alla fine di promuovere la pace, la sicurezza e la stabilità. 
L'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo è fermamente impegnata a diffondere questi principi nel Mediterraneo. Sono convinto che il dibattito odierno a Monaco, in un'atmosfera così propizia per lo scambio di opinioni e la condivisione di buone prassi ed esperienze, contribuirà a compiere passi importanti in avanti in un periodo cruciale e difficile per la Regione Mediterranea. Ora consentitemi di dire qualche cosa su quella che è la nostra organizzazione e come essa opera. L'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo è un consesso unico nel suo genere che riunisce i parlamentari della Regione Mediterranea. Siamo un'organizzazione interstatale con una specifica personalità giuridica e capacità internazionali, composta da 28 Stati membri e molti osservatori e partners. La nostra Assemblea è stata istituita nel 2006 ad Amman, a compimento del processo politico regionale avviato in seno all'Unione Interparlamentare alla fine degli anni Ottanta e noto come Conferenza della, sulla Sicurezza e la Cooperazione nel Mediterraneo. Nel 2009 l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo ha raggiunto un importante obiettivo per, la sua, eh, per il suo impegno, cioè ha avuto il riconoscimento di osservatore permanente presso l'Assemblea Generale delle Nazioni Unite. In questo momento epocale, per la sponda sud del Mediterraneo, l'azione congiunta dell'Assemblea parlamentare e del Sistema ONU volta a rispondere alle aspirazioni espresse dai popoli della nostra Regione, è stata decisiva e tempestiva. La fruttuosa cooperazione instaurata tra l'Assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE e la nostra Assemblea, che si considera anch'essa strumento complementare alla diplomazia tradizionale, ha permesso di rafforzare la nostra azione e di creare legami forti per abbattere gli ostacoli posti al dialogo e alla democrazia nei Balcani, in Medio Oriente e in Nord Africa. Siate certi che l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo è fermamente impegnata a sviluppare ulteriormente il suo articolato partenariato strategico con la vostra Assemblea e i vostri parlamentari, che noi consideriamo come partner fondamentali nella nostra missione tesa a promuovere e raggiungere la stabilità e la sicurezza nel Mediterraneo. Di concerto con l'Assemblea parlamentare della Bosnia e Zagovnia, con le Nazioni Unite e con l'OSCE, Stiamo ultimando i preparativi per una riunione incentrata sul processo di riforma costituzionale in Bosnia e Zagonia. Al sorgere della primavera araba, l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo si è schierata con i popoli di Tunisia, Egitto e Libia per collaborare con tutte le componenti delle società locali al fine di agevolare la trasformazione delle aspirazioni democratiche espresse nelle piazze in processi legislativi. L'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo ha immediatamente mobilitato in modo coordinato la sua rete di diplomazia parlamentare per le situazioni di crisi. Infatti, in questa direzione, l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo è fiera di essere stata un ponte operativo tra le due sponde del Mediterraneo e con la comunità internazionale all'apice della crisi. Tale azione concertata è stata determinante nel fornire assistenza umanitaria immediata e a lungo termine, così come competenze legislative volte ad agevolare i processi di transizione democratica attraverso riforme costituzionali ed elezioni giuste, con esiti estremamente positivi e tuttora incoraggianti. L'azione dell'Assemblea si è realizzata anche attraverso missioni sul campo di alto livello, come quella a Tunisi, dove abbiamo incontrato il Presidente della Repubblica Tunisina allo scoppio della rivoluzione dei Gelsomini. In stretta collaborazione con il Segretario Generale delle Nazioni Unite e Sua Eccellenza Ban Ki-moon, l'Assemblea parlamentare ha mantenuto aperto un canale di comunicazione con la Libia per agevolare le missioni degli inviati delle Nazioni Unite nel Paese e per garantire un corridoio umanitario a misurata nella spirale del conflitto. All'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo, l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo è una delle organizzazioni regionali invia, invitate a partecipare ai vari forum, forum umanitari sulla Siria a Ginevra, sotto gli auspici del coordinatore dei soccorsi di emergenza delle Nazioni Unite. In occasione di questi incontri l'Assemblea ha ribadito la sua totale disponibilità a sostenere gli sforzi umanitari e l'instaurazione di un dialogo politico in Siria. 
Il segretario generale della PM è in contatto con Kofi Annan, l'inviato speciale congiunto di ONU Lega Araba per la crisi siriana, i presidenti del Parlamento del Libano e della Siria, nonché il ministro degli affari esteri della Federazione Russa, al fine di agevolare il dialogo come richiesto dal segretario generale delle Nazioni Unite Ban Ki-moon. Il segretario generale della PM si recherà proprio per questi motivi presto in Siria per incontrare le autorità nazionali e gli osservatori delle Nazioni Unite. Fin dalla sua istituzione, l'Assemblea ha inoltre mobilitato i mezzi a sua disposizione per agevolare il processo di pace in Medio Oriente. La PM è l'unico consesso in cui i vicepresidenti della Knesset e del Consiglio Nazionale Palestinese, che sono anche i vicepresidenti della PM, in qualità di membri dell'Ufficio di Presidenza, si incontrano regolarmente per agevolare i negoziati. L'Assemblea parlamentare collabora strettamente con il Segretariato delle Nazioni Unite per assistere il coordinatore speciale delle Nazioni Unite, ambasciatore Robert Surrey, che ha partecipato alla riunione del nostro Ufficio di Presidenza lo scorso gennaio ad Amman, insieme al Ministro per gli Affari Esteri, Giordano Nasser Giudet. Come approvato dai membri dell'Assemblea nel corso dell'ultima sessione plenaria a Palermo, l'Assemblea ha avviato un processo di riorganizzazione delle sue attività al fine di raccogliere in modo ancora più efficace e completo le sfide della nostra Regione. L'Assemblea parlamentare è ormai divenuta, grazie all'impegno dei suoi parlamentari, uno strumento parlamentare mediterraneo pienamente operativo, votato al benessere, alla sicurezza e alla stabilità dei cittadini de della zona. Nel quadro del gruppo economico di alto livello, una combinazione di parlamentari e di attori economici indipendenti, ci stiamo adoperando per trovare soluzioni operative per affrontare i temi centrali quali l'energia, la sicurezza alimentare, gli investimenti per le infrastrutture, la disoccupazione e la creazione di posti di lavoro, nonché l'istruzione e per attribuirvi l'attenzione che meritano a seguito della primavera araba. Alcune questioni settoriali sono divenute determinanti per dare risposte giuste ed eque ai nostri popoli nel contesto della nostra regione in evoluzione. Un'audizione internazionale di alto livello dell'Assemblea parlamentare, delle maggiori istituzioni finanziarie europee e della Banca africana di sviluppo, nonché del settore privato, incentrata sulle misure politiche ed economiche a sostegno della crescita, degli investimenti e dell'accesso al credito per le piccole e medie imprese, si è tenuta proprio a Lisbona il 29 giugno ultimo scorso, su gentile invito del Parlamento portoghese. Inoltre sono lieto di informarvi che la nostra Assemblea organizzerà anche il 14 e 15 settembre a Ouarzate, in Marocco, un, eh, su invito del Parlamento marocchino in stretta collaborazione con l'Assemblea parlamentare del Consiglio d'Europa, il primo dibattito parlamentare pan-mediterraneo sull'energia rinnovabile con un'attenzione particolare all'energia solare. E voglio ricordare come questo tema fu introdotto all'attenzione proprio dell'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo nel 2008 durante eh, l'Assemblea generale che si tenne proprio qui nel Principato di Monaco a cui portò il suo contributo e portò le sue idee il professor Rubbia. Al fine di permettere la trasformazione delle sue riflessioni politiche sulle crisi in corso in soluzioni operative, l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo ha sviluppato una cooperazione articolata con la Banca Europea per la Ricostruzione e lo Sviluppo, la BERS, così da incentivare gli investimenti infrastrutturali e per le piccole e medie imprese per un totale di 2,5 miliardi di euro in quattro Paesi pilota segnatamente Marocco, Tunisia, Egitto e Giordania. In tutte le summenzionate questioni strategiche di interesse comune, l'Assemblea parlamentare si è dimostrata una solida organizzazione regionale capace di unire gli sforzi degli attori politici, sociali ed economici al fine di considerare la libertà, la pace e la sicurezza e auspichiamo un ulteriore rafforzamento in questa direzione della nostra cooperazione. Vorrei concludere sottolineando che l'Assemblea parlamentare del Mediterraneo desidera rafforzare ulteriormente il suo legame con l'Assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE 
per promuovere i nostri valori universali di pace e democrazia e integrare le reciproche iniziative per il bene dei popoli del Mediterraneo. E questa riunione di oggi va proprio in questa direzione. Vorrei richiamare a conclusione proprio quello che diceva poco fa il rappresentante del governo libico, come la politica dell'inclusione sia fondamentale per una regione importante come quella dell'area del Mediterraneo, dove se non c'è sicurezza non c'è futuro, non solo per il Mediterraneo, ma per tutto il mondo. Questa è una grande scommessa che io sono convinto insieme sapremo affrontare. Vi ringrazio per l'attenzione. Merci beaucoup, senator Amoruso. Je vais maintenant donner la parole à M. Mahmoud Erol Kilic, qui est le secrétaire général de l'Union parlementaire des pays membres de l'Organisation de la Conférence islamique. M. Kilic est également président du Musée des Antiquités islamiques d'Istanbul et président de l'Association des manuscrits islamiques du département des études sur le Moyen-Orient et l'Islam à l'Université de Cambridge. Il est professeur à la Faculté de théologie islamique de l'Université de Marmara. Monsieur le secrétaire général, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I would like at the outset to express my sincere thanks for your kind invitation to participate in the proceedings of the 21st annual session of the OIC's Parliamentary Assembly, which is being hosted by the August Parliament of the Principality of Monaco. This is not the first time for our union to take part in the fruitful sessions of your parliamentary assembly. The former Secretary General of the Parliamentary Union of the OIC member states, abbreviated as PUIC, had the honor to attend 12th and 14th session We would like now to reiterate our firm wish to jointly realize closer cooperation and relations between our two organizations. Certainly, this matter will be quite easy and feasible, taking into consideration the fact that six members of your esteemed assembly enjoy full and active membership of the PUIC, namely the parliaments of Albania, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkey, and Turkmenistan, in addition to six other partners, namely the parliaments of Afghanistan, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and Tunisia. We also fully support Libya's and Palestinian applications for being new partners of OIC. From this positive point of departure, we call for exchanger observer status between all two organizations. This step is confirmation and fulfillment of the wish of both organizations to enhance joint parliamentary action as well as confirmation of parliamentary diplomacy to play a pivotal objective role to advance understanding among peoples in order to serve the causes of peace and security. Achieving this letter is, to, is application to realize the hopes and aspirations of the entire nations of the world to economic and social development. Security issues as well as economic development are intermingled subjects. It depends on other parts, security and development, North security, should be considered as much as sought security. Ladies and gentlemen, the Parliamentary Union of the OIC Member States, PUIC, which has been established in 1999, includes 52 member parliaments belonging to geographical regions that span the continents of Asian, Africa, Europe, and Latin America. Its superior objectives aim inter alia at strengthening contacts, cooperation, and coordination with other parliamentary, governmental, and non-governmental organizations with the purpose of advancing common objectives. Our union also aims at fostering coordination among peoples of the world in order to respect and defend 
humanitarian principles, and the establishment of peace based on justice. Ladies and gentlemen, as historians called the cradle of civilization, the Mediterranean Sea region now has experienced substantial developments that have resulted in similar changes in the political and economic domain, which in turn have given rise to regime changes. The seventh session of PUIC conference held in the city of Palembang, Republic of Indonesia, in late January 2012 this year, addressed this popular dynamic and adopted resolutions thereon which focused in general on respecting the rights of people to choose their political systems through their own will and free choice. The PUIC took the initiative of congratulating the peoples of Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt on the triumph of their changing and wishing that such changes will contribute towards consolidating democracy, particularly following the success of elections in both Tunisia and Egypt. It is also necessary to underline the economic and financial crisis which the world is passing through with their contaminant negative impacts on the stability of states. We call, therefore, for doubling the force of our parliaments to maintain constructive and fruitful cooperation in order to firmly establish peace and security, which constitutes the genuine prescription of, for stability, good governance, the prevalence of security and justice, and reali realization the welfare of people. For the refreshment of our mind, uh, I would like to uh, give you some brief information about uh, the recent elections, which is some important points which I would like to share with you. Uh, as you know, in Algeria, uh, 10th of May uh, this year, there was an election. A record, uh, very important, it says a record 146 women were elected, making Algeria the first and only Arab country where women hold more than 30% of the seats in the parliament. Morocco, uh, last year, uh, 25th of November, uh, there was an election. Uh, as all you know, uh, on 13, 30 July, King Mohammed VI, uh, in agreement with the political parties, said that new constitution should be implemented through a new parliament. Elections, which were due by the September 2000, this year 2012, were brought forward last year to 2011. Egypt, it was uh, 22nd February uh, of this year, and after becoming the largest party in the People's Assembly, the Freedom and Justice Party won a clear majority in the Shura Assembly. The Freedom and Justice Party, as you know, was formed by the Muslim Brotherhood which had been banned under the former regime, the uh, FGP, and it is allies won 106 of the directly elected seats. Waft, uh, the Salafist Nur Party, which is based on Salafi movement, Nur Party took 45 seats, while Waft and Egyptian bloc took 14 and eight seats respectively. An additional 90 members are due to be appointed by the new Egypt President Mercy now. Uh, Tunisia, uh, it was uh, 23rd October last year, and Nahda party took majority, as all you know. And Libya, as His Excellency Vice Minister Mohamed Abdulaziz mentioned clearly, uh, inshallah, hopefully tomorrow uh, we are expecting uh, the voice of Libya after uh, 42, or as His Excellency cleared out, after 50 years, uh, there were no election, there were no any uh, democratically uh, representation of the people. Uh, as a conclusion, I reiterate our firm wish to cooperate between our two organizations, wishing your meetings to be crowned with success. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, monsieur le secrétaire général. Je voudrais à présent euh, présenter notre dernier invité. C'est monsieur Khaled Gelali, porte-parole de l'Alliance nationale démocratique libyenne, donc notre deuxième invité libyen. Monsieur Gelali est spécialiste des nouvelles technologies. Il est également directeur du bureau en charge des orientations politiques et stratégiques au Conseil local de Tripoli. Monsieur Gelali, vous avez la parole. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs, au nom de l'Alliance nationale démocratique libyenne, dont je suis le porte-parole, et au nom de, du Tripoli Local Council, qui est équivalent en fait à la grande mairie de Tripoli, dont je suis le directeur de relations internationales, je voudrais vous remercier pour cette invitation dans cette assemblée parlementaire de l'OSCE. Je voudrais également remercier Monsieur le vice-ministre des Affaires étrangères libyen, Monsieur Mohamed Abdelaziz, pour toutes ces informations et, euh, concernant la Libye. Je, mais je voudrais amener quelques petites euh, informations supplémentaires. Lors de cette révolution, mon pays a subi des pertes humaines considérables, plus de 50 000 morts et de disparus. Il est à noter que nous sommes que 6 millions de Libyens qui sont répartis de la manière suivante. Nous avons environ 2 millions d'habitants à Tripoli, 800 000 environ à Benghazi et 600 000 environ à Misrata. Le reste est réparti sur tout le territoire libyen. Il y a également une autre répartition qui est assez importante, c'est celle de l'âge. De nous, euh, nous trouvons, nous avons plutôt 2 millions de jeunes qui ont entre 0 et 15 ans. Nous avons également 2 millions d'adultes environ qui ont entre 15 et 60 et nous avons environ 2 millions de seniors. Ces informations sont très importantes car aujourd'hui la Libye est un nouveau pays libre, démocratique et ce qui est gênant aujourd'hui, c'est que lorsque je lis la presse écrite, je suis très surpris par certains articles sur la description faite sur la situation interne libyenne. Aujourd'hui, les journalistes comparent la Libye à un, autre, à un nouvel Irak. J'aimerais amener une précision. Il faut se rappeler que c'est une révolution faite par des civils, des personnes comme vous et moi. Nous nous sommes armés pour nous défendre contre les hommes de l'ancien régime sanguinaire. Après cette révolution, les citoyens libyens ont décidé de ne pas rendre les armes. Cela s'explique, entre autres, par la peur du retour des hommes de l'ancien régime. Même la mise en place d'un gouvernement provisoire n'a pas réussi à rassurer la population libyenne. La confiance a été rompue entre les citoyens et l'État. Pour être totalement transparent, malgré la quantité d'armes qui circulent en Libye, aujourd'hui, même si nous assistons à des tensions isolées, le pays est en situation sécuritaire certaine. Pour vous convaincre que le pays est sûr, aujourd'hui, nous n'avons pas de police, pas d'armée, pas de constitution. On peut imaginer que le pays est à feu et à sang. Mais ce n'est pas le cas. Les hommes, les femmes, les familles vivent dans la sûreté, grâce aux touars. Les touars, ce sont aujourd'hui les jeunes qui défendent la liberté en Libye. Ce sont les combattants de la paix, comme l'a souligné le vice-ministre. Demain, pour la première fois depuis l'existence de l'État libyen, et de la nouvelle Libye, les Libyens et les Libyennes vont voter. Après 42 ans de dictature, nous rentrons aujourd'hui dans un processus démocratique. Les attentes de la population sont très vastes. Aujourd'hui, on va élire un Parlement qui va développer et créer une constitution libyenne. Donc on se dirige vraiment vers un État démocratique et un État de droit. Pour conclure, quelles sont les attentes des hommes et des femmes libyens et libyennes leur première requête et leur première demande, c'est l'éducation. Aujourd'hui, c'est un de nos plus grands défis en Libye. Il faut combattre l'ignorance. Comme je vous l'ai dit tout à l'heure, je vous ai donné les valeurs, nous avons environ 2 millions de jeunes. C'est peu, donc on peut y arriver facilement, vraiment, mais c'est un grand défi. L'emploi et les salaires. Aujourd'hui, en Libye, nous avons un gros problème sur les emplois. Les entreprises n'osent pas encore revenir en Libye peur de l'insécurité, peur des armes, etc. etc. Mais aujourd'hui, il faut noter qu'on a également un problème de salaire. Nous sommes encore au niveau des salaires de l'ancien régime. Rien n'a évolué, rien n'a changé. D'où vraiment ces élections sont très attendues par le peuple libyen. Et le troisième point, pour finir en fait, c'est la santé. Aujourd'hui, 
nous n'avons pas de système de santé comme peut exister en France, à Monaco, etc. Donc nous, vraiment, c'est vraiment des attentes énormes. Pour conclure, je voudrais encore une nouvelle fois vous remercier pour cette invitation à cette session parlementaire et merci pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup, M. Guilani, pour ce témoignage. Je souhaiterais maintenant donner la parole à nos partenaires pour la coopération qui feront quelques remarques. Et à l'issue de ces remarques, j'ouvrirai le débat à l'ensemble de l'assistance. Donc, en tout premier lieu, nous allons commencer par M. Shkail du Maroc. M. Shkail, alors, vous n'avez pas plus de trois minutes Aujourd'hui. <rire> Bien, alors, euh, Monsieur le Président, honorable parlementaire, euh, Mesdames, Messieurs, permettez-moi de vous dire d'avance que nous venons de loin, que nous avons quand même dans cette espèce de droit à la parole. Alors, essayez quand même de nous écouter, au moins. Euh, C'est avec plaisir que je m'adresse à vous à l'occasion de cette 20e session annuelle, laquelle nous, l'espérons vivement, sera marquée une étape nouvelle dans la consolidation et le développement de notre partenariat au sein de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OCE. Monsieur le Président, lors de la 20e session annuelle de l'OCE tenue le 6, 16 au 10 juillet 2011 à belgrade serbe et suite à la demande qui vous a été manifestée par nos soins, vous avez eu l'amabilité en notre qualité de président de notre Assemblée en votre qualité de président de notre Assemblée, d'accorder une entrevue aux membres de deux délégations marocaines et algériennes, lors de laquelle vous avez souligné l'importance que vous accordez à consolider et à promouvoir davantage les liens de coopération entre les pays européens et leurs partenaires de la rive sud de la Méditerranée, plus particulièrement le Maroc et l'Algérie. Lors de cet entretien, nous avons passé en revue les grandes mutations politiques, ainsi que les défis sécuritaires qui vivent la région d'Afrique du Nord, des mutations qui nécessitent une attention particulière de la part des parlements nationaux et des gouvernements de l'OCE. À cet effet, vous avez émis le souhait que les organes décisionnels de l'OCE puissent instaurer un dialogue permanent et fructueux avec les parlements du Maroc et de l'Algérie dans le cadre d'une cellule de réflexion qui se pencherait sur les meilleures options pour accorder un statut de partenaire privilégié. Définissant des droits élargis aux deux délégations algériennes et marocaines au sein de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OCE, pour atteindre cet objectif, vous avez bien signalé qu'il ne refonde des statuts de notre Assemblée est nécessaire et qu'il serait envisageable lors de cette session, 20e session annuelle à Monaco. À cette occasion, nous saisissons l'opportunité pour vous renouveler officiellement notre aspiration à pouvoir privilégier dans le futur proche des meilleurs droits et devoirs à pied d'égalité avec nos partenaires européens. Et si nous tenons aujourd'hui à soulever cette question relative à notre statut au sein de la OCE, un statut de partenaire qui malheureusement ne nous permet pas de jouer des droits accordés aux autres membres permanents, c'est uniquement pour réaffirmer notre attachement aux principes et valeurs qu'incarne l'OCE, mais également pour exprimer, une fois encore si besoin, et notre ferme conviction de vouloir jouer pleinement notre rôle de partenaire à part entière au sein de notre Assemblée. Et ce, justement, pour contribuer à la réalisation des objectifs auxquels nous aspirons tous, à savoir la promotion des liens de coopération et l'installation des fondements solides pour une paix et une sécurité durable dans l'espace Euro-méditerranéen. Monsieur le Président, la région de l'OCE subit des mutations à tous les niveaux, politiques et sécuritaires, mais aussi économiques et sociaux. S'ajoutent à celles-ci les répercussions du changement dans les pays du voisinage européen, notamment en Afrique du Nord et du Moyen-Orient, où les vents du printemps arabe engendrent des défis sécuritaires décisifs. La situation que traverse les pays du Sahel démontrent bien que la lutte contre le terrorisme dans cette région est loin d'être achevée et que la sécurité y est toujours menacée. Réaffirmons qu'aucune région du monde n'est épargnée par ce fléau. 
Nous saisissons cette occasion pour condamner avec la plus grande fermeté tous les actes de terrorisme, quels qu'en soient les motifs ou qu'ils soient commis et quels qu'en soient les auteurs, en tant qu'ils constituent l'une des plus graves menaces contre la paix et la sécurité. Le terrorisme, vous le savez bien, s'en prend aux valeurs qui constituent l'essence même du respect des droits humains, de la primauté du droit et de la tolérance entre les peuples des nations. Permettez-moi également d'ajouter qu'à cette menace que constitue le terrorisme qui ravage la région du Sahel vient s'ajouter, comme on le sait déjà, cette, celle des organisations criminelles de trafic d'armes, de drogues, de prise d'otages et de traite des humains, etc. Toutes ces menaces sont aujourd'hui amplifiées par la situation politique toujours instable dans plusieurs pays d'Afrique du Nord et du Moyen-Orient. En effet, des dépôts d'armes ont été pliés en Libye pour ne citer que ce pays frère qui s'efforce de restaurer sa sécurité. Ces armes sont aujourd'hui disséminées dans plusieurs parties de la zone saharo-saharienne avec le risque d'échouer entre les mains terroristes liées au réseau d'Al-Qaïda dans le Maghreb islamique. Cette nébuleuse qui sème la terreur et règne en matière dans cette région. Tenons compte, Monsieur le Président, du caractère régional de ces menaces, le Maroc est déterminé à mutualiser ses efforts avec ceux des autres pays, notamment avec nos partenaires européens, afin, afin de faire face à cette situation fortement préoccupante. Les risques de déstabilisation de toute la sous-région sahélo-saharienne, dont certains des pays sahéliens connaissent des rébellions récurrentes, ne devront pas être sous-estimés. Nous souhaitons une sorte une sortie rapide des pays en, tra en, tra en transition vers la démocratie de cette crise qui a si, sur tous les pays limitrophes, des conséquences non seulement sécuritaires, mais aussi économiques et sociales. La situation nous préoccupe d'ailleurs, d'autant plus que les institutions démocratiques que plusieurs pays d'Afrique du Nord s'efforcent de mettre en place sont encore fragiles. La situation nous préoccupe D'autant plus que la pauvreté qui est réelle constitue un terreau fertile sur lequel le terrorisme peut prospérer. Mon pays, le Maroc, estime-t-il qu'au-delà des solutions sécuritaires immédiates, la consolidation des institutions démocratiques et le développement économique et social dans le cadre d'une coopération équitable constituent les seuls moyens d'endiguer le terrorisme et d'assurer la sécurité et la paix dans l'espace euro-méditerranéen. Je ne laisserai pas, en dernier lieu, la question de, le, de la Palestine. Ceux qui sont passés devant moi l'ont dit, mais moi, je tiens et je dis. Permettez-moi de dire ici amplement que tout ce que nous faisons ici et tout ce que nous espérons, sécurité mondiale, démocratie universelle, ne peuvent être instaurés sans que là, le problème de la Palestine soit résolu et que ces gens aient aussi droit d'habiter sur leur terrain, de gouverner leurs affaires. Et merci, messieurs, pour votre entente. Merci, M. Shkail. Je vais donner la parole maintenant à M. Bouara, mais je demande aux intervenants de... Euh, euh, se tenir à un temps de parole de trois minutes. Sinon, nous allons passer l'après-midi ici. Je pense que, de toute façon, les arguments les plus percutants sont souvent les meilleurs. Alors, M. Bouhara, vous avez la parole pour l'Algérie. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, permettez-moi tout d'abord de féliciter les autorités monégasques pour l'excellente organisation des travaux de cette importante session. Comme vous le savez, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, l'Algérie commémore cette année la, le cinquantenaire du recouvrement de son indépendance nationale. Elle célèbre cet événement en faisant le bilan d'un demi-siècle de combat pour la libération politique, économique, sociale et culturelle de son peuple et en définissant les contours des perspectives de son avenir. Mon intervention sera axée sur deux points essentiels. L'Algérie face aux événements de la région et l'Algérie face à son évolution interne. C'est le deuxième point. Notre pays affronte, comme tant d'autres, un avenir plein d'incertitudes. 
S'agissant de la situation euh, actuelle, l'Algérie suit avec une conscience euh, aiguë l'évolution d'une situation interne dominée par des impondérables et un contexte régional au bouleversement sans précédent. Notre pays œuvre dans la mesure du possible pour contribuer au retour graduel de la stabilité en Égypte et en Libye. L'Algérie est disponible pour accompagner ce pays voisin, en l'occurrence la Libye, dans sa politique de transition. Quant à la Syrie, notre pays se fixe comme priorité dans le cadre de la médiation arabe, l'arrêt des violences, d'où qu'elles viennent, et l'enclenchement d'un dialogue interne. Au sujet du Mali, puisqu'il s'agit d'un autre pays voisin, et j'en parle avant de passer à un pays voisin tout près de nous, à savoir le Maroc, donc au sujet du Mali, nous restons attachés à l'intégration territoriale de ce pays voisin et nous sommes disposés à relancer nos efforts de médiation. Le conflit qui affecte la région nord du Mali est une menace sérieuse pour la stabilité de l'ensemble des pays de la région. En ce qui concerne nos relations avec notre grand pays, le Maroc, le pays voisin, l'établissement de relations fraternelles, fructueuses et durables est une préoccupation majeure de notre pays. L'Union du Maghreb arabe, l'UMA, est un cadre privilégié d'intégration et de complémentarité. L'option pour l'UMA est pour notre pays un choix stratégique immuable. En février cette année, les ministres des Affaires étrangères se sont réunis à Rabat. Cette réunion sera suivie par une rencontre sur les questions de sécurité. Il s'agit là d'un acte prometteur pour la réduction et le règlement des divergences entre, dans nos, entre nos pays. C'est également un acte prometteur pour le développement de la coopération pour nos États. L'enlisement du processus de paix au Moyen-Orient nous appelle à doubler nos efforts pour trouver une solution à une situation que je qualifie, comme l'a bien qualifié mon prédécesseur, le président de l'Assemblée populaire, l'Assemblée parlementaire du Parlement européen, comme une zone de tourmente. Et là, à ce sujet... Je rejoins tous ceux qui souhaitent que l'autorité la, nationale palestinienne soit intégrée comme partenaire au sein de l'OSCE et un acte de ce genre constituera sans aucun doute un signal très fort qui contribuera à avancer le processus de paix dans la région. Il convient, et je reviens à, au Mali, la situation dans le sud de l'Algérie, il convient de rappeler qu'il y a une vision commune entre l'Algérie, le, le Mali, la Mauritanie et le Niger. Une vision commune a été élaborée et un comité militaire conjoint a été mis en place pour combattre le fléau terroriste. En ce qui concerne la situation interne, et je vais très rapidement, puisque le temps imparti est très court, je dirais tout simplement que notre pays agit avec beaucoup de lucidité et avec une grande audace pour procéder à des réformes profondes. Et sans aucun doute, vous avez suivi ce qui s'est passé ces derniers temps dans notre pays. Et bon, le sujet a été évoqué il y a quelques moments. Notre Assemblée nationale comporte 146 femmes à savoir près de 31% de l'effectif total de l'Assemblée nationale populaire. Des mesures ont été prises sur le plan de la libéralisation de, de, de moyens d'expression. Il y a actuellement une libéralisation au sujet des médias, en particulier au niveau du, de l'audiovisuel. La période dramatique que nous avons vécue et que vous avez suivie et qui a été dominée et marquée par la violence terroriste en Algérie a malheureusement perturbé le processus de démocratisation qui avait été déjà engagé il y a 23 ans. Malheureusement, des événements majeurs ont contribué à perturber ce, ce processus. 
Il y a eu en Algérie, bien entendu, la levée de l'état d'urgence. Il y a eu la multiplication des journaux. Et sur le plan économique et social, il y a un programme de rattrapage économique et social qui a été mis en place et qui a contribué à consolider les mesures de changement sur le plan politique, puisque les temps, les délais sont, sont très courts. Je dirais tout simplement, avant de terminer, que les élections se sont déroulées dans des conditions acceptables et euh, nous procédons avant la fin de l'année à des élections locales et nous espérons euh, améliorer notre dispositif électoral à cette occasion et donner la possibilité à notre peuple d'assurer une représentation euh, convenable de la société au sein des institutions élues. Je ne saurais terminer, Monsieur le Président, sans vous dire toute notre détermination à coopérer avec l'OSCE et nous sommes très satisfaits pour l'efficacité de cette organisation et nous sommes très satisfaits également des échos favorables que nous trouvons auprès de vous. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous remercie. Merci, M. Bouhara. Euh, je donne maintenant la parole à M. Hermesh d'Israël. Monsieur, euh, merci de bien vouloir veiller à respecter les trois minutes. Mr. Chairman and Delegates, to mention the Palestinians together with the Arab Spring is a real mistake, because the recent development in the Arab world have proved that the Palestinian issue is not, and I repeat, is not the main problem in the Middle East. The event in the Arab countries have to do with the internal political, economy, social, and religious problems, and not with the Arab-Israeli conflict. We hope that the recent development in the Arab countries will indeed bring more freedom, more democracy, and better economy and social condition for the population there because this is, this is what Israel stands for. What we don't like to see and also to hear is the anti-Israeli expression we witnessed in few cases. On the street and in some official statement, we think that the more democracy might bring better chance for dialogue and peace, but experience has taught us to be careful and not to be jumped into conclusions. See, what is going now in Syria, Hezbollah, Lebanon, Hamas, and the non-stop firing rocket from Gaza toward Israel, and the situation in Libya, which is not clear yet, as we heard just from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We support any action by the OEC and the Parliamentarian Assembly too to assist our Arab neighbors, but I don't think we should take any decisions about enlarging the group and the Mediterranean partner for cooperation before the dust has set down. Thanks so much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Hermesh. Vous avez fait court. Merci. Je vais maintenant ouvrir le débat. Nous avons une longue liste d'intervenants. Et euh, je vous annonce d'ores et déjà que la liste est clôturée, donc nous ne prenons plus de nouvel intervenant. Je demanderai à chacun de respecter un, un temps de parole de trois minutes, de manière à ce que tout le monde puisse s'exprimer. Nous terminions dans les temps et que les interprètes puissent également à se reposer. Donc euh, nous allons commencer avec M. Bernard Sabella de la Palestine. Monsieur, vous avez la parole. Yes. Uh, thank you, M. Gardetto. And thank you, Monaco, for a warm and sunny gathering and for the excellent organization that went into making it a success. Dear uh, Mr. Gardetto and colleagues, the aspiration of our people is for peace, justice, and establishment of a state. We see this as a basis for the security not only for Palestinians and Israelis, but also for the region and for Europe as well. We cannot at this time of change in your region and in ours, but see the challenges together 
as these are interlinked. Your security is as much tied to creating millions of jobs for our young people across the southern Mediterranean as it is in your success of overcoming the effects of the economic crisis in Europe. This symbiosis that exists across the Mediterranean makes it imperative that your assembly views favorably the report and draft resolution presented by Mr. Robert Marshall on, in, on enlarging the partnership with the Palestinian National Authority. The agenda today for us and Europe is a comprehensive one and not one to be imposed by one state over many others. In this respect, our application to partnership of OSCE is consistent with creating and maintaining a comprehensive and interdependent agenda. We cannot understand why Israel insists on denying the Palestinian National Authority the partnership status. Our experience in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly points that being present there is conducive to more open and frank exchange in spite of differences. Partnership in OSCE is not scoring a point for our side, but is rather an inclusivist invitation for continuing exchange and dialogue. At this stage of Arab transformations, Europe cannot be seen as being on the sideline. Partnership should be aimed at advancing these values that are essential to avoid conflict between states as well as imbalances within societies. We are confident that OSCE understands well that continued illegal Israeli settlements, the infractions committed by settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem are seen as unacceptable for the enactment of a two-state solution in which both Israelis and Palestinians are living side by side in peace and good neighborliness. We thank you for your support and we trust that our future will be molded together with you. There is no other way. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Sabella, pour avoir tenu les temps. La parole est donc maintenant à Monsieur Ricardo Migliori, vice-président de l'Assemblée, représentant l'Italie. Ricardo. Monsieur le Président, collègues, nous sommes assistés à une réunion e a un dibattito molto importante per certi aspetti storico perché la relazione del vice ministro degli esteri della Nuova Libia ci ha preso per mano conducendoci verso una nuova prospettiva. Ringrazio Jean-Claude Mignone e Francesco Moruso per quello che hanno detto nei confronti della nostra Assemblea e per gli elementi di cooperazione che hanno voluto sottolineare. Diceva Aldo Moro che se non c'è la pace nel Mediterraneo non ci può essere pace nel mondo e oggi questo messaggio mi sembra quanto mai vivo. C'è bisogno anche, e questa è la lezione di questa sera, di una nuova cornice di rapporto multilaterale tra l'Europa ed il Mediterraneo. Eh, noi usciti da qui torneremo nella logica del bilateralismo. Dobbiamo avere il coraggio di costruire insieme una nuova cornice multilaterale di rapporti. Io penso che sia fondamentale riuscire ad esportare i grandi tre elementi finalistici di obiettivi dell'OSCE in una cornice euro-mediterranea. Il tema della sicurezza condivisa, il tema della cooperazione, e quello dei diritti è oggi più che mai valido non solo 
per il nord o per l'est dell'Europa e dell'Eurasia, ma anche e soprattutto per il sud. Dobbiamo uscire dalla logica dei buoni propositi e delle cattive azioni. Ancora oggi l'Unione Europea spende i due terzi delle proprie risorse per i Paesi partner verso l'est e il Governo italiano, insieme a altri governi europei, chiede che almeno metà di queste risorse siano devolute alla progettazione e a un'integrazione economica del mercato del lavoro nei confronti del Sud, cioè del partenariato mediterraneo. Abbiamo appreso oggi, ed è questo un fatto molto importante, che la Libia vuole diventare partner dell'OSCE. Gli amici marocchini hanno nuovamente proposto, ed attendiamo con forza che lo facciano materialmente, la richiesta per fare un ulteriore passo avanti, e cioè diventare non più Paesi partner, ma Paesi membri della nuova OSCE, che si allargherebbe anche ad una prospettiva mediterranea, di cui non come Paese mediterraneo l'Italia ha bisogno, ma come Paese che crede molto nella capacità dell'Europa di proiettarsi anche verso sud. Abbiamo bisogno, cioè, tutti di un'azione nel nuovo Mediterraneo simile a quella che fummo in grado di fare dopo la caduta del muro di Berlino. È caduto un muro nel Mediterraneo. Pensiamo che oggi il canale di Sicilia sia molto più stretto, molto più vicino ed elemento di coesione rispetto a cinque anni fa e dobbiamo prendere quindi in seria considerazione questo nuovo quadro. Ecco, io penso che l'incontro di oggi sia stato molto importante, spero che a Tirana ne faremo uno altrettanto importante. Voglio ringraziare alla fine Gardetto che lo ha pensato, perché è stata una sorpresa vivere una giornata storica e gli amici in C di Monaco, proprio per la loro piccola dimensione geografica ma grande dimensione politica sono stati in grado di organizzare quello che in precedenza non eravamo stati in grado di fare. Voglio ringraziare l'amico Gardetto perché è stata artefice di una piccola grande giornata storica per la nostra Assemblea. Grazie. Merci beaucoup pour ces paroles aimables à Ricardo. Merci. Uh, la parole maintenant à M. Akba de Turquie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. With the outbreak of the Jasmine Revelation in Tunisia, the Middle East and North Africa region has been swept by Arab Spring movements. Arab Spring is a direct and national income of socio-political developments which the Middle East and North Africa region had to undergo, undergo during the past, past century. It is not possible to have a deeper understanding of the Arab Spring unless it is regarded as a continuation of a historical process. It is this continuity that renders Arab Spring irreversible. It is evident that there is no return to statu quo ante. Arab Spring has shattered the erroneous image that the region is both social and politically in a state of inertia. Countries in the region that go through the Arab Spring have responded to the process with reference to their individual social political experiences. On the one hand, we witness The Tunisian case was general elections were held with particular success and processes managed in an orderly manner. On the opposite side of the picture lies Syria, with a scene of the violent daily crackdowns by the regime on its own people, despite the setback after the controversial ruling dissolving the Egyptian parliament, we turn it hopeful once again with the election of the Egypt for civilian president. Yemen has opened a new chapter in its history after the presidential elections of 21 February 2012. Mindful of the demands of the Arab Spring, Morocco has undertaken reforms and organized elections accordingly. Libya will be holding general elections tomorrow. 
as the region has remained aliens to the idea of free and fair elections for so long. The organization of democratic elections in these countries is an achievement in itself. Elections in these countries should be as major steps towards democracy. Performances of elected governments will be crucial for the future of democracy in the region. Transition to democracy is often a long and arduous uh, process. However, a genuine democracy delivering fundamental freedoms to the people is worth the temporary difficulties faced today. What is incumbent on us is to extend our help to minimize these pains. No effort to provide the necessary assistance to these countries should be spared. In this regard, my country, Turkey, is always ready to share with our countries of the region her own experience of democracy and historical, institutional, and technical accumulation. We are ready to coordinate our efforts with our partners in this regard as well. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. La parole maintenant à Monsieur Demilly de France. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mes chers collègues, le, le printemps arabe, cela a été dit, a, a occupé les travaux de notre forum l'année dernière, suscitant un, un large espoir de part et d'autre de cette mer qui nous est commune, car ces révolutions se sont faites au nom de valeurs qui sont aussi les nôtres. Depuis un an, des processus institutionnels et électoraux ont été lancés. Certains sont encore en cours, d'autres quasiment parvenus à terme, d'autres encore, et je pense tout particulièrement à la Syrie, ne sont que mascarades et sinistres farces, le président de la République française l'ayant encore rappelé ce matin à Paris lors de la troisième réunion des Amis de la Syrie. Le printemps arabe, qui avait fait naître beaucoup d'espoir, débouche, débouche pour l'instant sur de l'incertitude politique due à l'inexpérience des nouveaux dirigeants, à la montée des communautarismes et à la terrible poussée islamiste. Pourtant, il faut dans cette tempête de l'adaptation maintenir le cap de la démocratie. Passer de la dictature à la souveraineté des peuples ou encore à l'édification de la démocratie, comme l'a dit le ministre libyen, est un exercice périlleux dont les difficultés ne doivent pas réveiller et alimenter le regret du temps passé. Ces transitions sont une chance pour la région en créant un cadre propice à l'épanouissement des talents qui ont toujours fait l'honneur du monde arabe. Mais ce pari de la démocratie, nous devons le faire dans la lucidité, car la démocratie, c'est aussi le respect de deux grands principes. D'une part, le respect du principe de l'intangibilité des libertés fondamentales, qu'il s'agisse de l'égalité devant la loi, de la liberté d'expression ou encore du droit des femmes. D'autre part, le respect du principe du pluralisme et donc de la possibilité d'alternance politique. Nous devrons être, mes chers collègues, tout particulièrement vigilants sur toute tentative de captation du pouvoir ou de restriction des droits démocratiques, L'existence de régimes autoritaires a pu, à tort, hier, apparaître comme un mal nécessaire pour garantir la stabilité, alors que le premier des risques, c'est bien sûr l'absence de liberté et d'alternance politique. Ce nouveau contexte doit au plus vite nous inciter à mettre au cœur de notre partenariat l'accompagnement de la nouvelle citoyenneté, mais aussi la jeunesse, la justice et la croissance. Les transitions démocratiques seront d'autant plus viables qu'elles parviendront à répondre aux attentes économiques et sociales encore accrues du fait de certaines retombées de la part de révolution. Enfin, ce nouveau contexte doit aussi nous inciter à sortir le processus de paix au Moyen-Orient de l'impasse. Les aspirations du peuple palestinien ne sont pas moins légitimes que celles des autres pays arabes. L'intérêt bien compris de tous est de parvenir désormais le plus rapidement possible à un État palestinien vivant en paix et en sécurité aux côtés d'Israël. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Demini, pour avoir respecté le, le temps de parole. Je donne maintenant la parole à Matteo Meccacci pour l'Italie. Merci, Président. Io credo che eh, questa occasione sia importante per cercare anche un po' di, di fare il punto dei nostri lavori e del nostro rapporto con i partner del Mediterraneo che abbiamo incontrato ormai 
eh, alcune volte da quando eh, è iniziato un vero e proprio sconvolgimento politico nella regione del Nord Africa che è partito dalla Tunisia e che ha riguardato altri paesi e che vede ormai tutta la regione essere impegnata in quello che possiamo definire come una sorta di eh, processo costituente regionale. Sappiamo che domani ci sono elezioni in Libia, poche settimane fa, eh, due settimane fa ci sono stati in Egitto, in Algeria, in Marocco, altre, altri mesi fa. Quindi credo che sia una situazione che deve porre dei punti interrogativi anche a tutte le organizzazioni internazionali come l'OSCE, come l'Unione Europea, il Consiglio d'Europa che sono impegnate in teoria a favore di un avvicinamento politico e istituzionale a questa regione. Ora noi siamo stati abituati in passato ad avere a che fare con l'uomo forte di turno, fosse questo in Tunisia, fosse in Libia, in Egitto e in qualche modo attraverso questo accordo politico eravamo come dire, garantiti che alcuni interessi strategici eh, in termini di sicurezza o di sviluppo economico eh, o militare fossero garantiti nella regione. Adesso si apre una sfida che riguarda questi paesi perché cambia il sistema politico, si va verso un confronto speriamo sempre più democratico e fondato sullo Stato di diritto fra i diversi attori, però questo mette in gioco anche il tipo di rapporto politico che noi abbiamo con questa regione. Allora la risposta politica che noi abbiamo dato finora con un atteggiamento sostanzialmente di attesa rispetto a quelle che saranno le eventuali richieste che questi paesi faranno all'Unione Europea, all'OSCE, al Consiglio d'Europa, credo che si dimostri totalmente inadeguato perché quando si crea un vuoto nella scienza, nella vita o nella politica, questo viene riempito. E se non ci saranno le istituzioni europee, se non ci saranno eh, quei valori che abbiamo sancito ad Helsinki di cooperazione in tutti i campi, da quello della sicurezza a quello dell'economia a quello della democrazia, è probabile che ci siano altri valori, che ci siano altri interessi, che ci siano altri paesi che hanno interesse ad avere rapporti politici forti con questa regione e che magari sono retti da regole di tipo autocratico. Non è una novità l'interesse che tanti paesi anche del Golfo, con i quali naturalmente intratteniamo rapporti in tanti settori, ma che sono retti da regimi autoritari, hanno per la regione del Nord Africa. Allora noi ci dobbiamo, credo, confrontare con gli amici dei paesi del Nord Africa su questo piano, essendo consapevoli che non abbiamo fatto molti passi avanti per quanto ci riguarda, ma chiedendo anche a questi paesi di fare dei passi avanti. Ora, abbiamo sentito le parole importanti del Vice Ministro Libico, constatiamo però anche che, come lei ha detto, domani ci sono elezioni in Libia e credo che sarebbe stata una cosa saggia se le autorità libiche come hanno fatto le autorità tunisine qualche mese fa, avessero ad esempio invitato il Consiglio d'Europa e l'OSCE a partecipare alla missione di osservazione elettorale. Lo abbiamo chiesto agli amici egiziani, sappiamo quanti eh, momenti elettorali ci sono stati in questo mese, sappiamo quante contestazioni eh, delle elezioni, annullamenti del, dei risultati dell'Assemblea eh, Costituente e quant'altro. Lo stesso agli amici algerini agli amici marocchini, io sono stato in Marocco per le elezioni e sono grato per l'invito che ho ricevuto, ma è stato un invito a livello bilaterale nei confronti del Parlamento italiano. Quindi credo che ci siano delle responsabilità comuni che dobbiamo assumere tutti insieme, essendo purtroppo consapevoli che a livello governativo vi è una lentezza nel rispondere ad eventi che si verificano sul terreno e nella realtà che non sono adeguate alle sfide che abbiamo davanti. Quindi se c'è un ruolo che i parlamentari possono avere in questo caso è quello di avere magari anche maggiore libertà di proporre un passo in più avanti in una direzione che sappiamo essere quella giusta, perché sappiamo quanto noi siamo legati economicamente, socialmente al Mediterraneo e pensare che le questioni economiche, le questioni di sicurezza possano andare avanti bene senza un forte rapporto politico istituzionale sappiamo che è un'illusione, che abbiamo visto dissolversi con il crollo di quei regimi autoritari e che speriamo non si ripetano in futuro. Grazie.
Merci beaucoup, Matteo. La parole maintenant à M. Christos Tilianides de Chypre. M. Tilianides. Mr. Chairman, a president social movements in the Middle East and North Africa region have sent the clear message of society's determination to be part of decision-making in what concerns their future. Election in Tunisia, the first election in the Arab world in the wake of the Arab Spring paved the way towards democratic transition. Challenges still pending in Libya. The outcome of the stormy election in Egypt have not appeared fears regarding the minor role of the military in government. In season bloodshed in Syria, which now counts over 16,000 victims to date, speaks for itself. Developments instruct the international community with increased responsibilities. Creator international support is necessary to the Arab Spring countries in transition with due respect for their ownership of the democratization process and specificities. Cyprus, for its part, is directly exposed to the impact of developments in the region. These are very difficult circumstances for Cyprus in its continuous efforts to carry out a successful presidency of the Council of the European Union. Cyprus has been preparing for a possible mass evacuation of around 200,000 foreign nationals and dual nationality holders from Syria in cooperation with the European partners and with assistance offered by the USA. At the same time, Cyprus has consistently warned its European partners about the possibility of being in Abu Dhabi with the refugees and asylum seekers from Syria and other neighbor countries. The Eastern Mediterranean region presents a growing challenge for the OC in its effort to consolidate its place in the new security environment. This should be translated into enhanced cooperation with Mediterranean partners as well as into further opening of the OC to those countries which subscribe to its commitments. The OSCPA has not exhausted all its potential to substantially contribute in efforts towards peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. Last but not, but not least, while noting with satisfaction the hosting of the 2012 OSC PM by Monaco, I wish to stress that cooperation issues with Mediterranean partners deserve a fully fledged OSCE Mediterranean Forum parliamentary event. Thank you very much. Merci. La parole à Monsieur de Donéa pour la Belgique. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, le caractère extrêmement important, je dirais même crucial du partenariat avec les pays nord-africains ici présents est illustré de façon éclatante par la crise au Nord-Mali, qu'ils ont d'ailleurs tous mentionné. C'est une crise gravissime qui risque de s'étendre à toute la sous-région. C'est également une crise qui est dangereuse pour la stabilité du, du sud algérien, du sud marocain, du sud libyen. Et c'est une crise qui est extrêmement dangereuse aussi potentiellement pour, pour l'Europe, pour la, la partie européenne de l'OSCE, puisque les rebelles du Nord-Mali, quels qu'ils soient, se financent notamment par le trafic de drogue vers l'Europe, par d'autres trafics, par la prise d'otages. Ils contrôlent actuellement trois aéroports au Nord-Mali. Et il est clair que la communauté des États d'Afrique de l'Ouest, qui prend de bonnes initiatives, ne pourra le faire sans un appui euh, très important, euh, essentiellement de l'Algérie, qui a les plus grands moyens à sa disposition, mais aussi, bien sûr, du Maroc et de la Libye, et aussi sans un, 
support logistique et un support en termes de renseignement des partenaires américains et européens de la CDAO. Et donc, je, je profite de la présence ici de ces trois délégations, et notamment de la délégation algérienne, pour dire à quel point je pense qu'il faut les encourager à s'impliquer, non seulement sur le plan politique, sur le plan de la médiation, sur le plan diplomatique, mais aussi sur le plan militaire, pour que les efforts de la CDAO soient appuyés également par le Nord, au départ notamment de l'Algérie. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur de Donéa, pour avoir respecté le temps de parole. La parole maintenant à Monsieur Voridis de Grèce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And dear colleagues, let me um, continue on the argument made by Migliori, Mekatsi, and uh, Stylianidis. Because I think that what we are dealing here is actually a very difficult and crucial situation. I think it's quite, it can become quite obvious from the debate that if this whole area becomes unsafe and unstable, then we all have a lot to lose. The question of security, of political stability, is closely connected with uh, issues like illegal immigration, uh, arms smuggling, drug dealing, terrorism, and after all, the security of the whole Mediterranean area, the sea, the sea that unites our countries and needs to be safe for commercial reasons. So it is quite important to be understood that we all have vital interests in the situation, in the evolution of the situation, in the Arab countries. And that is why all players, they must do their best. And from uh, the international community, what is expected is a very serious commitment in helping the countries that they are going to find the democratic route they deserve. So we all have to do what we have to do in order to secure that. And also from the countries and the new democracies that are arising after the revolutions, that they also have to do their part and to really take the best they can from um, the experience of the international community. So this needs to be, taken, to be taken much more seriously. And I think that even in uh, our assembly, we need to do more we need to pay more attention and we need to make our parliaments more sensitive towards such an important issue. One final point. I totally agree uh, that the relation, the, the issue of the Israel-Palestinian conflict, uh, though very important, it's not connected with those uh, evolution and those events that have been recently been taking place in this area. The, the, the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict goes a long way back and it needs to be seen in a separate context and not related with the uh, developments in the area. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. La parole à Monsieur Delvecchio d'Italie. Grazie, signor Presidente. Anch'io voglio esprimere le mie congratulazioni per aver promosso questo, questo confronto di idee importantissimo perché l'interesse della nostra organizzazione, lo abbiamo già detto anche in altre circostanze lo scorso anno, si sposta sempre più verso il Sud Europa e verso le relazioni tra i nostri Paesi e le nazioni della sponda meridionale ed orientale del Mediterraneo. Ecco, auspico in questo quadro naturalmente delle iniziative forti della nostra organizzazione per favorire il cammino e il processo democratico di quei Paesi in relazione a questo straordinario movimento politico, sociale che sta avvenendo in quell'area. Noi l'abbiamo chiamata Primavera Araba perché intendevamo con questo, queste parole caratterizzare 
l'avvento di una stagione di riforme e di nuova democrazia. Ma dobbiamo naturalmente operare affinché questa primavera, che era inimmaginabile fino a qualche anno fa, persegua gli aspetti che sono a noi più cari. La prassi democratica nelle relazioni all'interno dei Paesi, la libertà dell'informazione dei media, il rispetto dei diritti dei bambini, delle donne, della gente, la salvaguardia della dignità della, della donna. L'OSCE ha già fatto molto a tal riguardo. Io vorrei ricordare il sostegno che ha dato, eh, per esempio, per le elezioni in Tunisia, dove la sua presenza ha potuto testimoniare di una eh, vicinanza e di una partecipazione veramente democratica. Ma insieme a queste note positive non dobbiamo dimenticare che il processo di questa primavera araba incontra anche grandi difficoltà e concreti pericoli per la sicurezza internazionale. Mi riferisco alla situazione in Siria, dove un ormai una guerra civile di oltre un anno ha provocato 11.000 vittime tra, le, tra la popolazione civile. Ma mi riferisco anche alle derive terroristiche che questo processo innovativo potrebbe subire in alcune aree del Mediterraneo. Lo hanno ricordato e sottolineato molto bene il Presidente dell'Associazione parlamentare del Consiglio europeo, il Presidente dell'Associazione parlamentare del Mediterraneo, ma anche, e questo mi piace ricordarlo, i rappresentanti del Marocco e dell'Algeria che sono intervenuti prima di me. Ecco, io credo che sia importante allora che l'OSCE continui nella sua azione, nella sua, a sviluppare la sua capacità operativa per porre termine a quella tragica situazione in Siria, ma anche per sostenere ancora di più questo processo di democratizzazione e di sviluppo positivo del, 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 del suo movimento politico. E in questo senso non posso non sposare appieno quello che è stato l'invito del collega Mecacci. Se vogliamo veramente che ci siano dei risultati positivi, Credo che anche i paesi del Nord Africa e del Medio Oriente debbano volere il coinvolgimento dell'OSCE, soprattutto in quei momenti in cui la democrazia si manifesta come sono le elezioni. Grazie. Merci beaucoup. La parole a Monsieur Azopardi de Malte. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The recent and current arrest in the Middle East has caught the attention of the entire world. Calls for change in leadership growing louder and louder, and unfortunately, the instances of violence are escalating. The inhabitants of these countries are voicing their demands, not only for democratic rule, but for work opportunities and civil liberties like never before. The onset of globalization has brought about an acute awareness of their opportunities and li living conditions elsewhere. It is in this gap between expectations and reality that causes frustration among the un, uh, urbanized, undereducated and unemployed. Uh, in, the, in light of these uh, occurrences, it is only natural that, that the international community is concerned. The sight of the state forces using violence against demonstrations is one that we all wish that we had seen the last of. This point is particularly salient considering the contest wherein we are meeting today, the OSCE Mediterranean partners. We are all aware of the possible implications of this unrest on the borders of our continent. It was in this contest that Malta notwithstanding its limitations, offered its humanitarian help to the Libyan people during their recent uprising in Libya. We were extremely worried about the violence and violation of human rights. Such actions coming from either side should be condemned. Mr. Chair, going back to the general situation of the Mediterranean region, 
As things stand, there is a possibility of major civil conflict at our very doorstep, which, apart from human uh, tragedy, it involves it, it, that it involves would come with far-reaching implications. One also has to consider the migrat migratory flows, flows towards Europe that such events are bringing in, in Europe. Is Europe prepared to deal with a massive influx of refugees and asylum seekers as happened after the fall of the Tunisian, Tunisian regime? It is not beyond the realms of imagination that the Mediterranean once again find itself as a major conflict and conduit of northwards migration towards Europe. A scenario such as this would only increase the possibility of human tra tragedy on a large scale, not to mention likelihood of unscrupulous persons profiteering from such circumstances. It is in this regard that home affairs from Malta, um, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, and Cyprus called on the EU to adopt immediate uh, uh, as well as long-term measures aimed at tackling the influx of migrants because of instability in North Africa. Mr. Chair, two of the principal push factors of migration are poverty and war. Civil unrest in North Africa and Middle East will have ramifications that are not felt exclusively within their own confines only. Finally, it is sincerely hoped that violence and bloodshed do not continue to be the price to be borne for the sake of change. The territorial integrity of the nations in conflict is to be respected to the utmost. However, dialogue and discussion should be the medium applied to find a solution. I am convinced that dialogue and partnership with other countries will open the doors of economic and political opportunities that these countries have craved for such a long time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Merci beaucoup. Nous allons maintenant donner la parole à notre dernier orateur, M. Chorus, des Pays-Bas. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, you show us how a small country could be big. This country is small, but the hospitality is big. Thank you for that. And it is uh, an honor to have an excellent panel, uh, panel here with uh, a good input uh, that, that gives us also the opportunity to ask some questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, first of all, to the Vice Minister of Libya, I heard him telling about security, peace, border control, disarm, sounds very good, but what is still missing, or I missed it, the point of economic challenges, because if you have a law book on your head, but your stomach is still empty, it will create still problems internally in, in the country. Secondly, I'm curious if Libya uh, wants to ratify the Rome statue, because as we all want to fight against impunity, uh, this could be a mean to do that. Uh, are you thinking about that? Third point is the gender issue. Uh, uh, as we know, unfortunately, women are uh, often the, 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 the victims of a conflict. Women were also used as a, uh, a, 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 torf, a trophy an award. In your country, what happened with the prosecutors? Did they make any cases? Uh, did they put charges to those criminals who, do, who did that in, 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 in that case. Um, coming to Mr. Kulic, um, what is, for example, in the heads of uh, Europeans is some hesitation about when, when elections are in the Mediterranean countries, in the spring Arab countries, that when the fundamentalists, I, I, I put it openly on the table, Mr. Chairman, are coming to power, how is the relation with religion? And what does that mean to minority groups? Is the OIC 
And maybe I'm also looking to Mr. Prokopchuk with programs to, to fight against fundamentalism because that is always what Europeans think. Oh, the Muslim Brotherhood is coming or another fundamentalist group is coming. And how, how do they uh, mix or combine, for example, religion in politics? For example, I'm a member of the Christian Democrats where we are inspired by the Bible. It's no any problems to have, let's say, inspiration by a religion book. So, but when that happens in the countries, that could lead to some problems, and uh, a lot of European countries are afraid of that. Are you thinking of developing programs? Are you talking about that? Uh, that's my uh, question too. Uh, there are, of course, and my colleague uh, Matteo Macacci uh, tabled that, there are, there are challenges, but there is also one risk, for example, that some countries, big countries like China is coming, investing in those countries. Um, offering jobs, but no asking any question about human rights. And that's exactly uh, attra the, uh, the uh, attractive side, but that could be put you also in a dilemma. How do you, how do you deal with that? And last but not least, uh, Mr. Chairman, I miss the women here. And, and, I, and I miss also the input by the women. So I hope the next time, even in the panel, <laughs> there will be some uh, women uh, to give also an excellent input. Thank you very much. Monsieur Tchouskous, vous avez raison. Les dames ont été invitées, elles ne sont pas venues. Et je remarque d'ailleurs parmi les orateurs qui se sont exprimés cet après-midi, aucune dame ne s'est exprimée. Donc je le regrette également. Alors est-ce que, est que nos invités souhaitent répondre et faire des commentaires sur les interventions qui ont été faites tout à l'heure par nos collègues Monsieur le ministre, souhaitez-vous intervenir Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, listened uh, very carefully to all the statements that have made by the uh, various colleagues uh, representing organizations and countries. And I must confess that I'm very grateful because uh, the number of statements we have reached is very encouraging for us to move forward in the right direction. I've heard some colleagues uh, uh, insisting on the fact that OSCE should really take an active part in, in supporting the democratic process in North Africa. Very much welcome this tendency, and I hope that OSCE will be able uh, to do so. I have also heard the statement that uh, the security in the north and in the south of the Mediterranean is indivisible, and therefore, uh, before thinking about the economic dimension of the cooperation, we should also ensure that the security is attended to. I have heard also statements in relation to the need to combat terrorism, uh, organized crime, uh, smuggling of weapons, uh, illegal migration. These are key issues, in fact, that we have to unite in order to be able to fight this phenomenon more successfully. The only comment I would like to make is when it comes to illegal migration, we have two approaches that have to complement each other, the repressive approach, at the same time, the developmental dimension. If we focus more on the repressive approach as far as the security is concerned, it's not going to work. And if we focus more on the developmental approach without following the repressive approach, it's not going to work. I think the combination of the security aspect and the developmental aspect as far as combating illegal migration is concerned is extremely a viable approach to pursue. I think investing in, in some of the small scale projects, particularly in areas in neighboring, the, uh, neighboring the, the borders of Libya is the right step in the right direction. Sometimes small scale projects pay off because you give the opportunity to young people to settle and to respond to basic needs is not going to be costly, but it's important that uh, to show that this partnership of solidarity more than the partnership of interest as far as the illegal migration is concerned. We have also uh, listened to some of the cautious approaches that uh, some of the colleagues have spoken to, that while we are taking for granted there is a ter determination on the part of the, of the Arab Spring countries to move forward in the right direction as far as the democratic process is concerned, we have also to find the means to do so, not to have a chaotic situation that the uh, determination to have democracy may lead to a different, uh, I would say, different approaches in terms of destroying what we are aiming at. 
I think this is extremely important because we take this caution is in, a, in, a, in a very serious way. I think our determination to move forward with democracy, I think, should be also combined with our determination somehow to limit the, 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 the disturbing factors in relation to the process of democracy. Of particular importance, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like uh, to answer to some specific questions that uh, my friend from the Netherlands uh, have posed. He mentioned that uh, in my presentation, uh, I focus it more on the security aspects uh, without referring to the economic dimension of the problem. He's right. Uh, given the fact that I have not spoken the economic dimension because uh, the security is a priority at this particular moment. Uh, in fact, uh, the economic dimension in Libya is important. As you know, Libya depends on 98% of its income from oil. The vision of new, of new Libya is to how to diversify the Libyan economy to be also a service-oriented economy. We have to use the support and the involvement of the foreign investment in order to help us move forward in the direction of diversifying our economy. Uh, we were hoping that the uh, production of oil will reach the rate of uh, two years ago. In fact, at the moment, we reached the stage of about 1.6 million barrels a day, which goes uh, exactly to the level of uh, production in the past. But given the fact that the requirements of rebuilding Libya, rebuilding the infrastructure, uh, undertaking uh, a total reform uh, of our infrastructure is going to be very costly. Uh, the other issue that we would like also to make an appeal to those countries who do have uh, funds are frozen. Uh, we are uh, working very hard as far as the asset recovery uh, issue is concerned. Uh, some people talk about uh, 168 uh, frozen assets abroad. Some people think about, uh, talk about uh, less figure. Until this moment, apart from the funds that uh, some countries told us that are frozen at the moment, we do not know the extent of the number of, of the billions of dollars that are abroad. In fact, our investment uh, is clear. Uh, some of the investments are recorded uh, by those countries and us, and some investment are hidden investment. We don't know the members of the family of Gaddafi and what they have done with it because some of the investments are, are uh, registered under different names that we don't know. We have already established that the committee of so-called asset recovery committee that has start cooperating with some countries to know exactly what type of funds that are available in countries that we don't know. Uh, in relation to the other issue that we have asked, about uh, prosecution of abuses of human rights. I must confess that we are not really uh, somehow, uh, mm, uh, we are not somehow offended, let's put it this way, when we are criticized in relation to abuse of human rights. We do recognize that some abuses of human rights have been undertaken during the revolution itself and with some of the revolution <coughs> sorry, the revolutionaries themselves and we have documented cases that there are some abuses. On the other hand, we do understand that Libya is going through a very difficult and exceptional circumstance at the moment, given the fact that we don't have a judiciary in place, given the fact we have not yet established our courts, uh, there are some detention centers are under the government, there are other detention centers are not yet under the government, and really we are going in that direction. What we need from the international community is to give us a chance to do the right job and to be able to institutionalize the judiciary the way it should be in order to be able really to prosecute those who, who committed torture, those who committed abuses to human rights, those who could not respond uh, to the international commitments that we have because they think that these are special circumstances, particularly in view of the fact that the atrocities that are committed by the previous regime, particularly in view of the fact that the number of cases of, uh, of, uh, uh, of abuses during the last 40 years, those mass graves that we have discovered, uh, th these are things that are not easy for a common man in the street as a tribal society would understand because the revenge is very strong and the sense of revenge is very strong. To calm down the situation and to embark on a national, national reconciliation process, I think it will take time. What we need on the part of our friends and the national community is to be patient with us until really we establish the system that is capable of responding to this type of abuses.
Merci beaucoup, I, Monsieur le Ministre. The, uh, in relation to ICC, the last question. D'accord. Allez-y. Um, I'm very pleased that you have raised this question, and probably all of you know what happened uh, in relation to the team of the International Criminal Court that was arrested uh, in Libya for the last three weeks. And I must confess uh, that it came as a surprise to us because we always thought that the International Criminal Court is for justice but not for injustice. But we cannot uh, deal with this issue institutionally in terms of uh, blaming the court for the misconduct of some of the, its members, but we take it as very personal, I would say, conduct on their part. Uh, I can assure you that based on the uh, uh, investigation that was completed uh, by the Libyan investigation team, there was quite a number of abuses which really infringing on the national security of the country, particularly when it is documented and it is videoed. And therefore, we were negotiating uh, for the last three weeks uh, with the International Criminal Court to see how we can have uh, a conclusion of that part. I am happy that personally I have taken that file in my hand from the beginning until the end. And finally, uh, given the fact that the investigation of the, of the misconduct was completed on our part, and we're expecting the, the court to complete its part. And at this particular moment, I would like to say that the role of the Netherlands at this particular stage to facilitate the dialogue between Libyans and the International Court is really commendable because at the end, the Libyans decide to free the, the team, provided that the court will do its job in terms of continuing the investigation. I think this is the demonstration uh, of the Libyan, on the Libyan part that we are very keen to see that justice is going to be done at the same time that if we are going to be representing the state of the rule of good governance, we should really meet our international obligations to release the team and to see how the case would be handled in the future. In relation to whether we join the Rome statue or not, I think we are similar to some other countries that they still have some uh, kind of hesitance in relation to joining the, the statue because uh, we need our lawyers to study it very carefully because once we enter into commitment as far as being party to the statue, I think we have to deliver because we don't like to show, to, to, to follow the experience of the past regime that for the sake of uh, entering into party, entering into agreements, uh, ratify, sign uh, agreements, but at the end, nothing is implemented. We'd like to be committed once we sign and once we ratify, we should really deliver. Otherwise, there is no point in signing or delivering of or at cases we are unable to deliver, there is no point in that. So we have to be transparent, we have to be committed, and we have to deliver internationally, regionally, and nationally. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, souhaitez-vous intervenir? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief uh, in my comments. First, uh, I think the views expressed uh, at, this, at this meeting by members of the Parliamentary Assembly are very close, in essence, to, to the approaches that are taken in, in Vienna in, in terms of promoting cooperation with partners for, uh, with Mediterranean partners. Uh, probably one point I'll make is that, uh, and which did not feature much in our today's debate, is the fact of presence of uh, many international actors in the Mediterranean countries. And uh, the fact that the OEC as such is, uh, is not a very rich organization with uh, not much uh, financial resources. So basically, I think, again, that uh, there is a need to seek synergies with other international organizations like the United Nations, like the European Union, and uh, to provide from the, OEC, from the OEC what we can do best. This offer has been made, and it is on the table uh, for consideration of our uh, Mediterranean partners. And in respect to the question posed by uh, Mr. Chorus, uh, this offer of assistance also relates to, to some projects relating to, to the uh, human dimension, particularly the experience and expertise of the OC in the area of non-discrimination, of uh, tolerance. Uh, but uh, as you may know, there are certain limitations for OC activities outside the OC area responsibility. And this is why we would need also to have specific requests uh, coming from the partner states in terms of their interests, in terms of assistance they want to, uh, to get from the OC. But the offer is there and uh, all institutions uh, will be happy to pursue on whatever request we receive from the partner states. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, voulez-vous intervenir également 
Uh, just one question raised to me. Uh, actually, it needs very long time to analyze. Uh, it needs time, but um, briefly, what I can what can I say? Yes, I agree. There is a risk of uh, the spring. Uh, it is called spring turning cold. If uh, regressive forces uh, were to assume powers to get benefit some democratic process. But I believe, personally, I believe as a uh, professor of uh, Islamic philosophy also uh, in my main major, uh, it, traditional Islam is more comfortable uh, with the parliamentary uh, uh, aspects of uh, real Islam. Uh, these uh, so-called terrorist, uh, so-called, uh, let's say, Al-Qaeda movement, it is newly created. It is not rooted in the tradition of Islam. It is uh, created somewhere. It, it needs very long, elaborate this uh, case. And it is a very well known, it's an instrumental uh, of some uh, international powers uh, uh, so oh, I believe that even though if uh, accidentally, if they could gain some powers uh, in the parliament, in, in the parliaments of some Muslim countries, at the end, I believe that they, because of they totally uh, disagree with the parliamentarism, they, uh, they disagree, they don't accept the uh, consultation, they don't accept to listen to others, uh, so it it will end. At the end, they will uh, dissolve themselves, or uh, people uh, will uh, get rid of them. Uh, the traditional Islam will be uh, uh, for long history, as they uh, preserve, as they practiced. It will be. Uh, I hope it will be. Uh, gaining again their uh, majority voices in every field of the uh, Muslim societies. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Monsieur Gilali, vous voulez intervenir Allez-y. Je voudrais simplement euh, amener une petite précision euh, sur le poids des mots. Aujourd'hui, jusqu'à aujourd'hui, la Libye, euh, depuis en fait la, le début de la révolution, on a eu un gouvernement de transition. Et ce mot-là est très important parce que c'est un gouvernement qui a permis en fait de faire remonter toute la partie, euh, euh, disons, jusqu'à aujourd'hui, on n'a plus de constitution, on n'a plus, plus rien, disons, on repart à zéro. Donc c'est pour ça que euh, si on voit que la Libye est très très lente aujourd'hui au niveau des décisions, c'est parce qu'on a vraiment un gouvernement de transition. Après les élections, on va avoir un, un gouvernement provisoire. Donc là aussi, il faut vraiment être patient avec nous. Il ne faut pas avoir peur non plus de l'évolution du pays, parce que nous, les, on a fait cette révolution euh, dont le but est d'être un pays de droit et un pays démocratique. Concernant le droit des femmes, euh, tout à l'heure, j'ai entendu des choses sur les femmes en Libye. Il faut savoir que depuis cette révolution, le droit des femmes a été très important. Leur rôle a été très important. Euh, lors de la guerre euh, contre Kadhafi, euh, il faut savoir que beaucoup de mères ont poussé leurs maris et leurs enfants à aller combattre. Donc ça, c'est vraiment... Elles ont eu un rôle vraiment primordial. Aujourd'hui, au niveau des ONG, euh, tout à l'heure, euh, monsieur le vice-ministre libyen euh, vous a annoncé il y a environ 140 euh, ONG. Sur les, la moitié sont dirigées par des femmes. Donc ça, c'est vraiment important. Aujourd'hui, au niveau de la presse également, on a beaucoup de femmes. Euh, il ne faut, il faut pas euh, dire des choses... Euh, euh, nous, on n'est on, on on pas contre les femmes, etc. Pas du tout. Aujourd'hui, vraiment, elles ont un rôle prépondérant. Voilà. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Eh bien, écoutez, euh, ceci clôture notre forum méditerranéen. Je tiens à remercier euh, tous les participants qui ont contribué à ce forum, nos invités, euh, en les remerciant infiniment pour leur contribution et leur présence et euh, nos partenaires euh, pour la coopération qui euh, nous ont éclairés également, ainsi que euh, tous les, les collègues qui ont bien voulu participer au débat. Donc euh, euh, n'oubliez pas qu'à euh, la suite de ce forum méditerranéen, vous avez euh, un petit peu de temps libre, mais que euh, le programme culturel commencera à 17h30 
euh, nous visiterons ensemble la vieille ville euh, de Monacoville, donc, euh, et puis nous continuerons avec euh, la soirée dans le cadre du jardin exotique. Euh, donc, euh, je vous donne rendez-vous tout à l'heure. Je vous souhaite une bonne fin d'après-midi. Je vous remercie. La séance est levée.